Tech Switch on this sunny afternoon is alive with anticipation, awaiting one of the world's great motor races. Welcome to Alabama International Motor Speedway. In the shorthand of motorsports, Talladega. I'm Dave Desain, along with Larry Newber, here to bring you the action of the 12th annual Winston 500 NASCAR Grand National Stock Car Racing. And Larry, when the NASCAR stars come to Talladega, the watchword is always speed. It certainly is speed, and it might even be an understatement. We will see speeds today in excess of 200 miles per hour all day long, and these speeds will be made by cars running literally two, three, four, six inches apart. At one point in history, this track had the record for the fastest 500 miles ever run in a motor car race, and there are many who feel that record might come back here today. Indeed, not only one of the fastest races in the world, but also one of the closest. Last year's victory margin, three feet. Competition here is always just intense, Larry. At Talladega, it seems to be always intense. We've had massive pileups, 17, 19 car crashes here in the past decade. As you mentioned last year, the victory was less than a car length, and always, it seems, there are 10 to 15 cars running in the lead pack. And, of course, the names of the drivers in those cars, legends in themselves in racing. The Pearsons, Petties, and Allisons, the new generation, like Dale Earnhardt and Darrell Waltrip. And, of course, a whole new gaggle of rookies who have come here this year and made big news by challenging those big names. One of the great names in stock car racing is covering the action for us down on pit road. The 1961 Grand National Champion and veteran racing broadcaster, Ned Jarrett. Ned? Well, thank you and good afternoon, everyone. It's a beautiful day for racing here at Talladega. There'll be a lot of action in the pits here, and we'll cover that for you. There'll be joy for some and disappointment for others. Those that have the misfortune of falling out of the race, we'll interview them to find out exactly what did happen to them. They plan six to eight pit stops depending on the number of caution flags. They get about 100 miles on a tank of 22 gallons of gasoline here, and most of the top teams will change tires every time they gas the car up. Not that the tires wear that fast, but cool tires will run faster than those that are heated up. So we'll be covering that pit action for you here this afternoon. Well, they'll be racing for a third of a million dollars here this afternoon. It's going to be a big payday for somebody. We're just moments away from the start. We'll be back with the Winston 500 in just a moment. <laughs> to win this 500-mile stock car grind, you have to finish. And Ned Jarrett took a look earlier at one of these cars' systems that helps ensure a good finish, the lubrication system on these 3,700-pound stock cars. A lot of things have changed about the race car since I was driving one, and one of those things is where the oil is carried on a race car. Now, this is an oil pan that would be bolted on the bottom of an engine of your passenger car and like was used when I was racing. It holds five quarts of oil. Now, they have the oil capacity in the trunk of these race cars. Now, this holds about 15 quarts of oil, three times as much as in a normal passenger car, and they use 50 weight oil. It is pumped from the engine back to this reservoir, and they even have the capacity to plug it in electrically, heat the oil up, which is very important before they rev the engine up. This serves another purpose also. They locate it in the left rear of the quarter panel so that it puts weight here so it can affect the handling characteristics of the car also. Thank you, Ned. We'll be back with more racing action from Talladega, Alabama, after this. Good afternoon, everyone. The drivers are getting ready to start this 500-mile race, and starting on the pole here today from delivery of Harry Rainier is Bobby Allison, a home state favorite here. Bobby, you got to be pleased to be racing for the home state folks. Well, Ned, that's for sure. I love it here in Alabama, and uh, I'm real proud and happy to be on the pole and uh, I just hope that we can have a good day. Well, good luck out there. And starting on the outside pole is last year's winner from Charlotte, North Carolina, Buddy Baker. Starting in the third position will be a rookie from Franklin, Tennessee. The car number 37, the highest he's ever started in a 500-mile race is Mike Alexander. Mike, how do you feel? Right now, Ned, I guess I'm a little leery of, of what we're going to do, and uh, we're going to take our time in the first half of the race. Do you have some butterflies in the stomach? Oh, yeah, I've had them for a while this morning. Well, good luck out there. Thank you. Starting on the outside is the current Grand National Champion from Dooley, North Carolina, the car number two of Dale Earnhardt. 
the Rod Osterlin machine. And starting in the third row, on the inside, another rookie from the state of Florida is Rick Wilson in car number 62. Rick, how do you feel? Feel pretty good right now. Any butterflies for you? Oh, just a few right now. But they'll probably go away when that green flag drops. And starting on the outside of the third row, a former winner here at Talladega is Neil Bonnet of Hueytown, Alabama, another of the home state favorites. And now let's meet the rest of the superstars of this 500-mile race. In row four will be Terry Labonte and Kale Yarborough. And back in row five, Terry Gant, who has a brand new ride after changing teams to Taylorsville, North Carolina driver in the school abandoned Pontiac. And Ricky Rudd is alongside him on the outside. The field moving off pit road down a leisurely trip down the front straightaway, where in just a few moments the speed will escalate to more than 200 miles per hour. In row six will be Darrell Waltrip, four times the winner in NASCAR competition already this year, and a rookie, Elliot Forbes Robinson, known for his road racing exploits, now tackling the stock car scene. Starting in the seventh row, position 13 and 14, Richard Childress and Donnie Allison. Donnie also with a new ride here, driving a Harry Hyde machine. Row eight will be Joe Ruckman and another rookie, Stan Barrett, the fastest man on four wheels in the world. We'll talk more about that later. Row nine, Buddy Arrington and Benny Parsons. And in row 10, Connie Saylor and Joe Milliken. Moving back to row 11 will be Richard Petty, the fastest of the second day qualifiers here. He starts 21st alongside rookie Ron Boucher. Another rookie, Tim Richmond, starts 23rd with Bill Elliott alongside. And in row 13 will be Kyle Petty and Bobby Waywack. Now the leader is moving down that 200-mile-an-hour backstretch and approaching turn three here at Talladega. Row 14 will be Dick May and Lake Speed. And in row 15, Jody Ridley and Morgan Shepard. The 16th row comprised of Bruce Hill and Cecil Flash Gordon. In row 17 will be James Hilton, one of the nine millionaires in this field today. He's won more than a million dollars in NASCAR racing, and Tommy Gale will be alongside him. Row 18 will be Tommy Houston and Jimmy Means. In row 19, J.D. McDuffie and Ronnie Thomas. Now rounding out the field, the 39th and 40th starting position belong to Rick Newsom and Dave Marcus. And Larry, there are some great stories all the way through this field. Well, to start off with, of course, the greatest names in the history of stock car racing, but the biggest story of this week to this point has to be the sterling performance of a couple of young rookies. Starting on the inside of the second row in a red number 37 from Franklin, Tennessee, maybe the start of a Tennessee gang, the likes of the Alabama gang, Mike Alexander. He's just five foot five inches tall, weighs a mere 130 pounds, just barely enough to stand on the accelerator pedal, but does he ever stand on the accelerator pedal? Last week, he was the overall fastest qualifier for the Grand National Race, and this week, he is the third fastest, the first time he's ever been on a super speedway in these cars. Starting right behind this young driver, on the inside of the third row, in car number 62 from Florida, is Rick Wilson. Rick Wilson has only been driving race cars for six years. He's made a rapid climb to the top. This is just his third time at the big tee at Talladega Speedway, and he is the fifth fastest qualifier here for the Grand National Race this weekend. As the field comes rumbling by, starting the last of the pace lap, we're prepared for a green flag here at Alabama International Speedway. We'll be back with the start of the Winston 500 in just a moment. There has been so much talk here at Talladega about the draft. This is the last slow trip down the backstretch for these drivers. Next time by, the speculation is 201, 202, perhaps as much as 205 miles per hour. Dale Earnhardt, I think, said it best. If you want to run fast on Sunday, you'd better hook up with the B team, Buddy, Bobby, or Bonnet. The reference there to Bobby Allison, the pole sitter, Buddy Baker, the defending champion, or further back in the field, but very much a charge of the sixth starter, Neil Bonnet. Those three cars have all demonstrated the ability here to lap at well over 200 miles an hour. Dave, and it's important from the drop of the green flag to be able to stay with the leaders. The speeds are so great here that if you get behind at any point in the race, it's very difficult to keep up. 
We anticipate 10, maybe as many as 20 of the lead cars in the fastest draft in the early stages of this race. And again, it's very crucial to stay up every single lap around. 188 laps to go. Well, they're going to stay this close through much of the afternoon if past history here at Talladega is any indication. The field rumbling down. 25,000 horsepower about to be unleashed. The pace car is on pit road. Harold Kinder has the green flag in hand. The Winston 500 is rumbling down, preparing for a start as the pole sitter, Bobby Allison, prepares to go. Everybody in the place is tense with excitement. Nobody more tense than those 40 drivers who are waiting for that flicker of green, and we're underway. The 700 tons of automobile racing machinery and scientifically prepared equipment roars into that number one corner, and Dave is saying it looks like a familiar side out front, the silver and black of Bobby Allison. Allison jumping out to that quick lead, chased by Buddy Baker. Baker trying to go down the inside. Mike Alexander is there in the thick of it as they hurdle down the back stretch. Now Dale Earnhardt has moved up to third, takes over the number two spot, and it's Earnhardt going after Baker as they hit turn three. The land rushes on here at Alabama International Speedway. Allison to the top of the track with Earnhardt down low. They're running side by side. That's not the fastest way around. It's Buddy Baker out front, and Neil Bryant has now moved into fourth place as they come down for the completion of lap number one. While running in the draft, as Dave pointed out, if you're side by side, it slows both cars down. It has to work to the advantage of the driver out in front when you have cars behind them running side by side. It looks like Allison was able to propel, propel himself forward by using Neil Bonnet right behind him. It looks like the Bonnet Allison train on the high side may take over the number one position. They have decided to put that draft side by side now as they go out onto the back stretch. They've gone three and four abreast. And look at this charge from Cale Yarborough coming up on the inside. They stuck them three deep into the 33 degree banking of turn three at Talladega. Unbelievable racing. Baker in the number one. Oh, he's got a spin, a crash. Richard Petty is involved. A tremendous tangle at turn three. Cars spinning, careening all over this racetrack. Petty among the cars that tangle. One of the two Petty automobiles in this field here. There is the battered machine of Benny, Benny Parsons. Parsons. This field is going to go under yellow very early in this race. Well, this is not an unheard of circumstance at Talladega. We've seen it before. Allison is the leader. There is a pall of smoke and dust hanging over turn three. Larry, that's what can happen in this kind of very close competition. And you're absolutely right. It does appear to have been Richard Petty who has never won this race, and it looks like that string is going to continue here today. Son Kyle has already gone by the start-finish line. There you see Bill Elliott limping home to the pit area. The Dawsonville, Georgia driver in the Mel Gear Ford. Probably excessive tire rub on the fender as that car seems to be listing toward the forward as he coasts in with a lot of smoke coming off underneath the race car. Now, circumstance erupted back in the second pack of cars. The lead draft trying to break away, and all the leaders were able to successfully get off. All the leaders were able to successfully get through that melee up there. The, the action started back uh, further in the pack, and among the victims is going to be number 22, Stan Barrett, who's well, headed for the pit. We had talked about Barrett earlier in the race, and it looks like his race is going to end very early. Dave set him up as the fastest man on four wheels, a reference to the fact that at one time he held the world land speed record. Barrett is a very interesting guy, and it's really a shame that he's been knocked out of this event, or at least seemingly so, so early. He's a former Golden Gloves champion. He holds a black belt in karate and, of course, probably most well-known as one of Hollywood's top stuntmen, Stan Barrett. Here's a replay on what occurred in that incident in the middle of the pass. You see Benny Parsons and Richard Petty apparently touching, quite unusual for those two veterans, Parsons, listing up toward the outside wall, giving Petty not enough racing room. Looks to me, Dave, like they're of the Skull Bandit race cars. Connie Saylor, who flipped so terribly at Daytona in February, is involved in that black, yellow, or uh, the uh, yellow number four on the roof of the race car. And, of course, the field behind bearing down at better than 190, approaching 200 miles an hour. Tim Richmond, the Indianapolis 500-mile race rookie of a year ago, in that red and white number 99, just barely missing the disabled Connie Saylor car as it coasted down toward the infield. There's son Kyle coming right up behind that pack. 
Well, you remember the last time we saw the stock cars on ESPN? Richard Petty had a similar circumstance. He was involved in a big melee here, and it's happened again at Alabama International Speedway. Joe Milliken, number 75, also got into the fray. He is from Randleman, North Carolina, and that is the hometown of the racing Petty clan. We are under yellow here at Alabama a crash occurring on lap three it has brought the field down from racing speeds well over 200 miles an hour in the early going allison baker having the battle that we all expected here and we'll be back to that battle in just a moment let's go quickly for an update on the crash harry gant and ned jarrett ned? well another of the drivers that was involved over there harry what started it well uh we were you know right behind the fast pack and, and uh like daryl i mean uh Kale, Buddy, and Earnhardt, you know, was going in the corner. I was right behind a 21, and Darrell drafted by on the outside, and Rick Wilson was on the inside. When Darrell went to pull in, he caught my front end, and he went, you know, quarter panel, and it turned him sideways. Well, then Rick caught me on the left side, and it knocked me. Broke the traction, turned me in the wall. <laughs> Not a thing to worry you can do. And Nothing you could do. No, I was lucky. You know, Darrell was lucky that, uh, you know, he didn't stand out there, and, uh, and I was too. I mean, I just, I got to get in the wall. I was like nobody didn't hit me coming across the track. There's a couple cars. Hit a shot, but it didn't really, nobody got hurt there or anything. Knowing the full field bearing down on you at over 200 miles an hour, what kind of a feeling does it give you? We just hope it don't hit me, you know. Uh I got the apron on the bottom down there, so I guess it's one of the lucky times. Well, Harry, we're glad that you're okay. The green flag is waving again. Without Harry Gant, they have gone back to green here at Alabama International. The Alabama gang, or at least one member thereof, is out front. It is Bobby Allison who has grabbed the lead. Buddy Baker tucked right in behind him as they go down the back stretch. Now Baker looks to the inside for running room, and Baker takes the lead. Buddy Baker, a four-time winner on this racetrack. The only man who can make that claim is out front again here today and this is the 12th running of the Winston 500. Allison in that number two spot. Moving up into third, Neil Bonnet and also on the charge now is Darrell Waltrip. He is riding fourth and behind him in the fifth position is the Grand National Champion Dale Earnhardt. If they come down to the completion of lap number 11, we've got a 10 car grab out front. Right back where we started, Larry. Yeah, we are and uh, I think that's going to become a very familiar scene as this day wears on. You know, as we watch Baker, not only has he won more races at this racetrack than any other of the Grand National Stars in the 12-year history of the Talladega racetrack. He also has led more laps, 885 leading laps credited to Buddy Baker and the closest man to him. Well, there goes Buddy Baker being pushed off the edge of the cliff. He lost the draft, and you see five competitors streaming by on the inside. I was about to say the next leading lap leader of all time is, guess who, the man in front right now, Bobby Allison, who has led 486 laps prior to this race, and he's about ready to record one more if he can get to the trioval without being passed. That was a classic example in Baker's case of what happens in the draft. Baker was out front, they nipped under him, he pushed him up to the top of the racetrack, and Baker went from first all the way back to sixth in the time that it takes to talk about it. So now you've got the Alabama gang out front with Allison leading Bonnet down the back chute. There's that eight-car freight train. We should make two points, I think. First, when we talk about history at Talladega, wait a minute, here's the Alabama gang side by side into turn three. The charge down on the low side from Neil Bonnet, and Bonnet is going to take the lead momentarily. Allison comes back around the outside, and Earnhardt in the yellow and blue machine. The number two car is right there in the thick of it. Boy, what a battle. Well, what happened in that case was Bonnet was left out hanging to dry. He had nobody behind him when the draft came up on the outside. Nobody supported Neil Bonnet. You cannot lead at this racetrack without somebody behind you pushing you along. And look what happened to Bonnet. He's lost two, four, six, seven positions. It looks like he's going to drop in the line eight in that line. He was leading just one half of a lap ago. Well, that's the classic example again of this Talladega draft. We were making the point that they do run two races here every year. They run the spring race, the Winston 500, then come back in the late summer months when it's so hot here in Alabama to run the Talladega 500. And when you take that composite record, Buddy Baker is the top cat on this racetrack with four victories. Bobby Allison, who is currently running out front, has won here before. And last year, Buddy Baker beat the man now in second spot, Dale Earnhardt, by just three feet to the flag. So Earnhardt knows a little bit about what it's like to sit right there in that spot behind the leader. 
on the super speedway so far in 1970 or 1981. Here's Neil Bonnet flowing on the back chute. Neil Bonnet, who less than a lap ago dropped out of that lead draft, obviously had problems in addition to losing the draft. Something is wrong with the Wood Brothers Purolator automobile. The Ford car is coming down on the apron. Meanwhile, the leaders are battling. Here's the third place war with Buddy Baker, who scrambled back up into the thick of it, and he's right alongside Cale Yarborough. Allison and Earnhardt are tied together nose to tail. What they would... Oh, we've got a spin. A car out of control and skating down through the infield. Car number 20 of Rick Newsom from Lake Wiley, South Carolina, coasting onto the grass. Masterful bit of driving as he gathers it back up and he's managed to pull that maneuver off right at the entrance to Pitt Road. So he'll be able to take that car in for service. It will bring out the yellow flag. The Newsom automobile going behind the wall. And so that's going to bring it back on the yellow flag. Allison and Earnhardt had hooked up. They were trying to get away from the rest of the field by running that two-car draft. But now we'll start all over again as we go under yellow, punch them back up, and prepare for a second restart here. The second yellow flag of the day at Alabama International Speedway. We'll be back with more of the Winston 500 in a moment. We're back at Talladega, Alabama, Alabama International Motor Speedway, under yellow in this 12th running of the Winston 500 as number 20 Rick Newsom blew an engine, spun down to the infield, little damage to the automobile other than in the engine compartment. Newsom spun the car around and came right down onto pit road, got it under control, and immediately took it back behind the wall. So Newsom is out for the day. He has brought out the second caution flag in just 18 laps of action here, Larry. Well, Newsom is one of the younger drivers, at least in terms of experience. He's been racing cars for 15 years, however. He has been up and down in Grand National Racing since 1973. He's one of those private, independent teams that work so hard just to get to the races every week, let alone finish up near the front. All of the leaders have availed themselves of the opportunity to come on pit road for fuel and for tires. All of the lead cars in that lead draft now have fresh tires, and that should push the speed back up over 200 miles an hour when we go back out. This is also a nice opportunity for number 62, the uh, young rookie from Florida, Rick Wilson of Bartow, Florida, and the Dick Hutcherson, Jake Elder prepared machine to lead the Winston 500. What a thrill that's got to be for one of four rookies who qualified in the top 16 spots for this race. It's been a good week for the kids. Yeah, it really has. And being quite a good year for the kids, as a matter of fact, Wilson is one of the bigger surprises among the rookies. A lot of people felt that people like Tim Richmond should do well. He had experience at these super high speeds running for Indianapolis cars back home in the north. But Wilson came almost out of nowhere in terms of the knowledge that a lot of Grand National people had of him. He's worked very hard on this team. He was super quick this week, and up front here at the Big T, it's got to be one super thrill for him. Bad news for Neil Bonnet, one of the members of the Alabama gang expected to run up front here today. Bonnet has blown an engine, and he is out of the race. Also out of the race, of course, the eight cars was crashed in the early running, so the attrition has been high here thus far. When we went under green, it was Bobby Allison leading this race over Dale Earnhardt by a margin of about three or four inches. Buddy Baker right up there in the thick of that lead draft. The fourth spot at that moment belonged to Darrell Waltrip, and he had Cale Yarborough to contend with. Those five were part of an eight-car draft that were just hammering on each other all the way around the racetrack. We are going to be going back under green this time by the pace car. No, check that. I believe they'll give them at least one more lap as they continue on pit road to do a little maintenance work on the surface there as there was some, some oil there was lost from the crash. So we'll be a lap away from a restart. Rick Wilson, the young driver from Florida, is officially being shown as in the lead. Among the leaders that pitted, however, we did catch their order as they came out of the pits, and here is how the lead draft is running. Of course, 
right now they are. Bobby Allison was the first among the leaders to get out of the pit. Dale Earnhardt was close behind, and Cale Yarbrough picked up a couple of positions. He's third among the leaders that, are, again, are running in the middle of the pack. Buddy Baker is in there, then Darrell Walter, Ricky Rudd, and young Mike Alexander. So those seven cars are in the middle of the field as you look at the race cars on the speedway, where we expect them to hook up in a seven- or eight-car freight train move to that high racing lane and move toward the front. We had mentioned a couple of the cars that have already dropped out of this event, in addition to the number 33 car of Harry Gant, who was the trigger of that massive seven or eight car pileup in the early running of this race. Connie Saylor for the second super speedway race in a row has been wiped out of competition by a crash. Benny Parsons officially out of the race. Richard Petty. Jody Ridley, Bill Elliott, and Stan Barrett were the other drivers that were eliminated from this event early on. Also dropping out now with mechanical problems, rounding out the attrition list, Neil Bonnet and Rick Newsom. Let's remind you that the very latest scores, the highlights, interviews, all the news from the world of sports is brought to you throughout the day on ESPN Sports Center. Sports Center comes your way with 30-minute edition several times every day and night. Monday through Saturday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time and Sunday at 11 p.m. We have probably taken away the opportunity here to see the fastest 500-mile race ever. For a report on what's happening down on Pitt Road, we'll be going down to Ned Jarrett, I believe, in a moment. Let's stand by for that as we check this field. It is indeed still under yellow, and it appears that they will need at least one more lap to clean up that situation down along Pitt Road. Let's find out what happened to the number 21 car of Neil Bonnet, considered one of the favorites here in this race. For that report, let's go to Ned Jarrett. Well, Glenn Wood, the car owner, who's a former driver himself, he, uh, Glenn, he uh, is out of it early here. What went wrong? There's an old oil pan somewhere. I'm not sure what it was. Uh, it could have been a valve or a rod one. Uh, we hadn't looked yet. An unusual occurrence. Well, it, it's unusual at this point in the race. And you've had a lot of unusual things uh, happen already this year. Well, that's true. It, it seems like a different thing every time. We're trying to get Neil's attention. He's back here with us, uh, Glenn. We're sorry to see you have that tough luck. If we could get over here to Neil now, we'll get a word with him. Neil, well, we're sorry to see you out of it here in your home state so early. <laughs> it's a short day in a hurry, Ned, I tell you. The, uh, the car felt awful good, you know. Everybody was apprehensive about the way the car was going to drive on this big track. And... The cars are driving exceptionally well. Though I don't see any car out there in the front that was unstable, so it ought to be some pretty good racing. Well, we're sorry that you're out of it. We'll go back to the tower now. That's a disappointment for the Alabama gang, the Hueytown, Alabama crew, including Bobby and Donnie Allison and Neil Bonnet, who's been a protege of the Allison brothers through the years. They were very optimistic coming into this weekend also, Dave. Neil, when talking with him yesterday, said the car has felt so good all year long he couldn't believe they hadn't won yet. He thought today would be his day. We are going to be watching now as this second caution comes to a close. We are anticipating the green flag this time by. We will be seeing uh, Rick Wilson sitting out front of the number 62 machine. The lights are still on on the pace car. That should indicate that they're going to go at least one more. The problem here is oil that's been dropped from the Rick Newsom automobile when he blew that engine. Obviously, the oil on the racetrack makes it a very, very risky situation for the rest of the drivers. So until that situation has been completely cleared up, they will keep this field under yellow. We were making the point, Larry, in the, at the top of the show that we had thought of the possibility that this would be the 500, uh, the fastest 500-mile race in the history of motorsports, but it's certainly not going to be that at this uh, pace. Well, a couple of years ago, Lenny Pond set that record at this racetrack, and in the running of the 1980 Daytona 500 at Daytona Beach, Florida, Buddy Baker eclipsed that mark. And with the speeds that these cars were running, particularly in the draft situation the past couple of days, everybody thought that this race would provide another new 500 mile record, the fastest 500 mile race in the history of automobile racing. As we look at Kyle Petty on pit road, the hood is up now. That looks to be me to be a little more than just a broken windshield problem, Dave Despain. Uh, indeed it is. They've obviously gone to work on that number 42 machine. Yes, indeed. The record hopes appear to be out the window, but the thing that will remain is the 200 mile an hour draft. There's Richard Petty walking off Disappointed at his outcome, but still smiling nonetheless. What a great seven-time champion he is. Confirmation, there was a piece of uh, exhaust system from the Newsom automobile that was discovered just about the time they were ready to 
to put the field back under green, and that's what uh, prompted this additional lap under caution. Now the lights are out on the Pontiac Turbo Trans Am pace car as the field circulates at about 80 miles an hour. That is the clue that we're about ready to crank it back up to 200 miles an hour. And the thing to watch, Larry, will be that lead pack prior to the yellow coming back through traffic and moving to the front. You know, one of the people who started in the middle of the pack was Donnie Allison. Well, not exactly the middle, but back in 14th position, just a little bit off the pace of the front runners. Donnie is right now on the tail of the tandem of those front runners that had that lead draft going. So we will be watching also for the orange and green colors of Johnny Allison in the number 77 race car. That's a new Harry Hart prepared car, their first race together. Allison said he thought his problem would be that he would lose the draft early in the race. Now the yellow has put him right on the tail end of that lead draft. So with 22 laps about to go into the book, the green flag is out, and we're back underway at Alabama International Speedway. Rick Wilson leads Richard Childress and Jim Richmond down into turn one, and the charge is back on here at the world's fastest motor. Speedway Wilson is down onto the apron. Right off the bat, Rick Wilson goes down low. Look out, everybody goes up top. He's got a massive crash again. Well, no, check that. It's not massive. We had two other cars spin and some outstanding race driving going on in the middle of the pack. There are two of our early leaders that look to be Bobby Allison and perhaps Daryl Waltrip. Somebody in the middle of the pack, just about at the location of the lead draft cars that we had been describing, got out of shape, and there were two other spinners in the middle of the pack. Allison and Yarborough spinning and getting down into the grass, but they managed to get back up onto the racetrack and continue. The yellow is back out. It has been an absolute demolition derby here in Talladega today, and this time the key factor is two of the fastest cars in the field, two of the early leaders, were involved in that fifth half. It started in turn one when Rick Wilson went down on the low side of the racetrack. He was the leader. When the yellow flag disappeared and the green came back out, Wilson did not get through turn one. He took it down low on the apron, ultimately got into the grass, and I, it's hard to speculate what goes through a driver's mind in that situation, Larry, but you could almost see the, the field, perhaps gun-shy from what had happened in turn three earlier, all shying up to the top of the track as they saw the dust down below where Wilson was, and I think they thought he might come back up the racetrack. I think an excellent observation. When I looked up at the first point when I saw the dust from Wilson, and there's Bobby Allison's car trailing the rear bumper. Bobby Allison's car was damaged to the rear end part of that machine, and the bumper trailing along behind. There is the current leader, I believe, Richard Childress, followed by Jim Richmond. The safety car will be looking to pick up the leaders this lap around. I had begun to comment that when I first looked up after having noticed the, the dust from Rick Wilson down on the inside of the racetrack, I'm confident, Dave, that I saw at least four race cars sideways right in the middle of the banking, and several of the drivers did an excellent job avoiding those spinning cars, and I saw no contact with the outside retaining wall. This is going to bring the leaders back on pit road when we talk about the leaders. Remember now, we're talking at this moment about cars that are well back in the pack in the sense that it is your lead draft. Allison and Yarborough, both on pit road and both with damage to their machines. There's the number 28 car, the Pole City, the Uno Buick, built by Haas Ellington, or check that, the uh, Wrangler Pontiac. They have pulled the bumper off the automobile, the five racers automobile of Bobby Allison. The back well, bumper has been stripped away. It doesn't appear that the car is badly damaged. No, no, it doesn't. I just wonder how that will disrupt the aerodynamics of this race car. I understand we had Ned Jarrett standing by in the pits. Ned? The pits, there appears to be nothing wrong with the front end of the car. As you mentioned, the back bumper is torn loose from the car. They're changing all four tires, taking the car over to be sure there's no sheet metal on the tires that they have in service, and he's away. But you can see that the rear bumper is gone, but that should not hurt him too much. We'll try to get over here to Waddell Wilson and see what, uh, what they do plan to do with the thing. Well, we'll have to come back to you in just a moment, Dave. So the five racers view it of Bobby Allison heads back out into the fray. Cale Yarborough has also been in for attention. We should be able to get the field back and intact and under green with 25 laps. And that translates to 66 and a half miles. The 500 mile battle in the book. We'll be back in just a moment. We're back at Alabama International Motor Speedway after the fourth caution flag of the day has slowed this field and kept our race average well below 100 miles an hour. What looked like it might be the fastest 500-mile race in history now threatens to become one of the slowest, but we're about to get back to 200-mile-an-hour action. 
reminder, ESPN brings you North American Soccer League play each Saturday live all season long. Will the Cosmos repeat as a soccer bowl champion? In action, the likes of all-time greats like Giorgio Chinaglia, the NSL's leading scorer last year, North American Player of the Year, goaltender Jack Brand, all-stars Arno Steffenhagen and Mike Connell, top draft pick Joe Maroney and Washington's Jim Brown, who scored an unbelievable goal to win an early season game. The NASL powers like the Cosmos, Seattle Sounders, Fort Lauderdale Strikers, Chicago Sting, and the Tampa Bay Rowdies. Great NASL soccer live each week on ESPN. Larry, we're about to get back to it here. We've shuffled the deck as far as the running order, and we've also got some cars that are damaged out there. What's that going to do? Well, the, the leaders are peppered throughout the field. There's absolutely no order of running out there right now. Among, a, among the top contenders, three race style, who have damaged race cars, Dale Earnhardt, the defending national champion, severe aerodynamic disruption to the front of the race car. Kale Yarbrough took somebody in the side, the right side of the race car. He's got damage there. Car number 28, Bobby Allison, who sat on the pole as the fastest qualifier, has damage to the tail. Will it disrupt that car aerodynamically? We'll only have to wait and see. Car number one, Buddy Baker is having quite a raft of problems. They completed a windshield change as the green flag flies. We're under green and racing at great speed once again. Buddy Baker's crew replaced the windshield in just 55 seconds. But two or three laps later, while running under caution, they discovered they had some clutch problems. He's having a very difficult time getting into and out of the pit at any kind of speed whatsoever. Ricky Rudd had the lead coming out of that yellow flag as a virtue of all of the pit stops, but that lead is being challenged down the back stretch. Bobby Allison and Dale Earnhardt have picked up right where they left off prior to the yellow flag. Allison, the leader, and Earnhardt in that number two position. There is the two-car draft that earlier this week was recorded at over 205 miles an hour on this racetrack. Rudd is staying with them. Rick Wilson is four. No way is Earnhardt's car going to be nearly as stable as it was when the car rolled off the race shop assembly line. You noted that as Dale went through the north banking for third and fourth turns, as we now went as the first and second turn on the last lap, he was not nearly as close to Bobby Allison as we are accustomed to seeing the car's draft. Normally, they're less than a foot apart. You can see Earnhardt giving Allison a little bit of room. That's because Earnhardt doesn't know exactly what to expect. The flow of air over that blue and yellow number two is considerably disrupted from the way the car was built and intended to direct the flow of air. So Earnhardt, though he's running up the front, driving flat out at top speed, foot all the way to the floor, he's still being a very, he's still being a little cautious, trying to find out exactly how that car is going to handle. With 41 laps in the book of 188 to make up the race distance here, 109 miles down, it's ironic that three of those lead four cars were involved in the melee that brought out this most recent yellow flag. The car in fourth spot, Rick Wilson from Bartow, Florida, spun down low on the apron, and as he did so, he forced all the leaders up to the top of the track where they bumped and banged a little bit. Allison got into that. Neil Yarborough also suffered some sheet metal damage, and Earnhardt met up the front of his car. Wilson, the black car, forced in line there of the leaders as they rocket down the backstretch. We are told from timing and scoring has lost at least one, possibly two laps. He did have to pit for lengthy repairs during one of the caution flags, so though Rick Wilson, who qualified so well here this week as a young rookie, continues to run with the leader, he is not among the leaders in the standings of the race. Of 42 laps complete here in the Winston 500, 26 laps have been run under the yellow flag. The race speed being held down to below 100 miles an hour. A new fourth-place car, Darrell Waltrip, has worked himself up into fourth position now as he tries to reel in that lead draft that is not getting away as we had thought they might. We have a retirement down on pit road. It looked like the number 50 machine pulling in. That's Bruce Hill getting some work. And also on the charge is Buddy Baker. Baker, third in that pack right there, is moving up on Rick Wilson. Those are your third, fourth, and fifth place automobiles. Third place is Ricky Rudd, fourth Rick Wilson. Here is your lead draft, and they indeed are beginning to open up a little bit of space. This is the draft that everybody talked about as the one that was capable of going over 205. This is the one the rest of the drivers were concerned of. If there was any duo on the racetrack that the rest of the crew chief feared might break away from all of the other top contenders and threaten at least to make a shambles of this race for first and second position, it was this one. 
A lot of people, I think, breathed a sigh of relief when they saw the damage go to the nose of Dale Earnhardt's car. I'm sure they felt, well, that's history. No way will Earnhardt be able to tack in behind Bobby Allison and pull away from everybody, but Earnhardt's doing it, and they've opened up about a football field between themselves and the third, fourth, and fifth place machine. For those of you who might be new to the sport of stock car racing, when we talk about the draft, we're talking about the aerodynamics of the cars. When two cars hook up and run together like that, they're able to run faster than one car, which has to beat its way through a 200-mile-an-hour wall of wind all by itself. When two cars can hook up together like that, they're capable of running faster than one car by itself. But in this case, it is significant that Ricky Rudd is able to stay right with them. Buddy Baker has now moved up into fourth position. Fifth is Rick Wilson. Baker had problems on his car with the clutch during the series of yellow flags, and he was having trouble getting back up to speed on the restart. But this time, he's right in that lead draft. As you watch the lead draft, the only problem that is on the mind, or the only potential problem on the mind of the drivers who are in second, third, and fourth place in the draft, they have to be very careful to watch their temperature gauge on the race car. These cars do have a tendency to overheat when they're tucked right in behind the driver in front. You see Earnhardt moving down to the inside. He's probably noted the temperature has begun to creep up just a little bit. He needs to move out of the wind. Even though he gives up speed, he slows down himself and Allison, but now he gets some fresh air and hopefully cool the engine down. In this case, Earnhardt does not look like he's going to be able to get around Allison. He would have hoped to get around to stay right on Allison's back fender, but he didn't get quite enough of the draft. Maybe it was that disruption in the front of the race car. Maybe the air isn't blowing across that car smoothly enough to allow him to accelerate from behind another and take advantage of the draft. And Earnhardt can't get back into line. He goes from second all the way back to fifth in that draft, which is already overlapping slower cars. It is Bobby Allison leading Darrell Waltrip. We incorrectly identified him as Ricky Rudd. That is Darrell Waltrip. Those cars are similarly painted in 1981. This is the Dew Crew, the Mountain Dew automobile of Waltrip in the second spot with Buddy Baker riding third, Rick Wilson back in fourth spot, the rookie from Bartow, Florida, ran so well at Daytona a year ago, and now back in fifth is the reigning Winston Cup champion, Dale Earnhardt from Dooley, North Carolina, in his Dale Inman prepared machine. We've got a car going behind the wall. That is going to be the number six car of Joe Rutman, who has moved up in the standings by virtue of those yellow flags. Well, Rutman had qualified for the 15th starting position this week. He surprised a few people by qualifying that well. He makes his home in Upland, California right now. He is the son of the 1952 winner of the Indianapolis 500-mile race, Troy Rutman. Earlier, the two-car teams in this race had all been reported retired. Bud Moore's two cars, Benny Parsons and number nine Bill Elliott were out as a result of that early crash. The Reynolds Needham Racing Team, the sole bandit team, comprised of Stan Barrett and Harry Gant. Both were damaged in that crash and retired. Richard Petty was knocked out by that crash. Kyle Petty has been in and out and in and out, and that car is back out on the racetrack now, so Petty is back in the track. It's been a long day for Kyle watching Daddy crash early in the race, and he was running very close to Father Richard when the crash occurred. And Dave, as you have pointed out, they've had all kinds of problems with the number 42, the legendary number 42 today. But Kyle trying to pick up valuable experience as again we look at the lead pack rocket shipping down the back stretch, this 4,000 foot strip of asphalt that's just. 48 feet wide, there's a 12-foot apron on the inside of the racetrack, but you don't want to be down there. If you're down on the apron, you're in trouble. And Buddy Baker in the UNO-sponsored car number one car has moved back to the front. We've got a seven-car draft, a seven-car freight train hooking up up front with Buddy Baker, the winningest driver ever on this track, currently out in front. And Cale Yarborough has overcome the front-end damage that he suffered in that earlier shunt up in turn two, right about where they are right now on the racetrack. And Yarborough has moved up into fourth position in that pack. He's nailed right to the rear deck of Darrell Waltrip as they go thundering down. And we had a lap just a couple of laps back at 199.09 miles per hour. So the aerodynamics seem to be quite intact. Interesting point. Neil Barnett, who is out of the race now, says the difference between 199 and 205 is just unbelievable. There's Petty. He is back out. That is Kyle Petty. Daddy Richard is out of the fray. And Kyle, by the way, has dropped the valve. So he's going to just go as fast as he can out there and try to score some points here in Winston Cup Racing. The leaders, as they move around this racetrack, have got to have a lot going on in their mind right now. The number of caution flags that we've had in the early stages of this race has to have really changed all of the strategy. Now, 
They can go about 35 laps normally on a full load of fuel, and that is the primary reason for pitting in a 500-mile race featuring Grand National stock cars. The tires will go just about as far as the teams would like to have them go. They have to stop for fuel at least every 35 laps as we look at the battle for ninth and 10th between Mike Alexander and Sherry Labonte, two of the real young lions, and young lions they are in Grand National stock car racing. They're still on the lead lap with this lead pack, which is now coming to the trial with the complete lap number 51. Alexander and Labonte racing for ninth and 10th spot. These guys are squabbling over the top eight positions, as you can see, with Buddy Baker out front. Dale Earnhardt in that number two spot. Darrell Walton tucking in in third. Dale Yarbrough is fourth. Rick Wilson is fifth. Bobby Allison has been up at the head of that draft and has now fallen all the way back to the back. But the point is that when you're anywhere in that lead draft, you have that potential to go for the front anytime you want it. You can use that slingshot pass. Here's Waltrip pulling down on the inside. Out of the draft, Yarborough will try to come with him. It's Darrell Waltrip and the new crew machine going side by side with Earnhardt in the second spot. The big Buddy Baker at six foot five inches and well over 200 pounds puts that big right foot down and says nothing to it. And he holds off that charge. Waltrip out of the draft and drop kicked all the way back to about fifth spot. That's the way it works here at Alabama International, where the draft is so critical for these drivers. And can you imagine the nerve that it has to take to drive like that? Picture yourself out on the freeway with a bumper to bumper and moving along at a snail's pace. Just speed that film up to about 200 miles an hour, and you've got some sensation of what it's like for these guys out there. So Walter has had a great year so far. He's won four times on the Grand National Trail more than any other driver. He's currently in fourth position in the point standings and third in the money winnings. He is one of five drivers who have already won over $100,000 in the 1981 season. There are the leaders coming around turn number four, coming down toward the start finish line, past this throng of 100,000 plus. They're now moving to the flyover, which is banked about 17 to 18 degrees, and approaching the start finish line, which is positioned past the trioval and near the entrance of the number one corner on this 2.66 mile speedway. That seven car draft has just put the 53rd lap of this race in the book. 141 miles complete, 135 laps or 359 miles still to come. And this is much more what we had anticipated in terms of the kind of action that we're going to see here in this Winston 500. We've got seven cars running in that lead draft. You know, you get the feeling and I I think the drivers would never admit to it, but you get the feeling that maybe these guys have collectively decided without communicating with, with one another that, well, you know, we better just settle down, get about 50 or 60 good laps of this race under our belt, and then maybe we can go hard charging races. They all seem to be running fast, but pretty calm right now. There's not a lot of darting around. They have to change positions periodically, as we mentioned, primarily because of the temperature of the engines as they're tucked behind one another. But they really seem to have settled down. They're all looking for that steady pace. Get this race underway. Get going. And let's see if we come home to victory lane. The up and down Petty Crew fortune down again. Apparently the broken valve is going to take Kyle out of it. He is again reported as behind the wall and back in the garage. And that sounds like that's going to be terminal for Kyle Petty, who has been in and out of this race so far. A good point, I think, Larry. The fact that normally at this juncture in the event with a little over 100 miles in the record book, these guys would have been fully accustomed to that high speed, nearly 200 mile an hour draft for lap after lap. They would have the feel of the tempo of the race. They would begin to feel out each other and who has what right there on the racetrack. It looks flat, but that part of the track is banking 18 degrees. Then here in turn one, they swoop up into the 33 degree banking, and the handling of the cars is absolutely good. But because we have run 26 laps of this race under yellow, these guys are really just starting to get their bit in the teeth now with uh, 55 laps complete. You know, another factor that they have to have a firm hold on, particularly going into the final 100 miles of the race, is fuel mileage, miles per gallon. How far can we go at top speed before we have to come in for pit, for a pit stop? And of course, with all the caution flies that we've had, the crews have not had an opportunity to check their fuel supply, to, to monitor just exactly how much are they using per lap, how far can they go. And Junior Johnson explained to me earlier today, up and down pit road, that that can change dramatically during a race. The crews expect to get better mileage as the race wears on. That assumes that the driver will be able to get into enough high-speed grass to pull off that throttle pedal just enough to save fuel. But at this point, everything has been scrambled. Nobody knows really what factors and variables they're working with. 
I think it's an uh, appropriate time to give a call to that car that's in fourth place. Now, they're working slower traffic, so you've got a lapped automobile there as they work their way down the back stretch. The leader is Baker, second is Earnhardt, in third is Cale Yarborough, and then about five or six car lengths back, just dropping back out of the frame. Right there, Rick Wilson. He's from Bartow, Florida, and he's one of the rookies here. One of the sparkling crew of rookies we have coming into this race, and I think Rick Wilson is certainly acquitting himself very well here today. He was a little concerned about his rookie status. He knew that uh, he and, and Mike, referring to Mike Alexander, another rookie who qualified third fastest for this race, knew that they would have to keep their noses clean, that everybody would be watching them to see how they did in this race. Well, we've had cars spinning and crashing all over the racetrack. Wilson, one of the drivers who was involved, as he got down on the low side of the racetrack and spun and forced some of the leaders up, and they got bumped a little bit. There you see the damage on Earnhardt's car that resulted from that shunt. But now Wilson has settled down, and he's right there. Our lead draft of Baker, Earnhardt, and Yarborough. And Wilson did not even come into this race as one of the top ranked rookies. The top rookies in ranking coming in were Morgan Shepard, who won the last race in the trail, Tim Richmond, and Mike Alexander. Speaking about Alexander, for those of you who live in this... of this young man he still is out there he is on the lead lap with the lead cars and right now he is hooked up in a draft which is considerably behind the leader he's hooked up in a draft with terry labani and with johnny allison matter of fact i think we might have just picked him up there they are that's alexander there in the red car at the front with terry labani right behind the texan and the fourth car in this line is johnny allison the orange and green colors of harry high back on that lead draft there are seven cars involved in that lead freight train now buddy baker continuing on the point baker loves to lead he's the kind of driver who will always stick it out front if there's any way to do that and here today despite the clutch problems that have hampered him on the numerous restarts four times we've gone under yellow and then had to come back with a restart on the restart baker has been having trouble getting back up to speed because of the clutch malfunction but as you can see here that certainly is not affecting his performance at all Buddy Baker squarely in his sights. Cale Yarborough, the wily old veteran, county commissioner down in Simmonsville, South Carolina, who has, uh, or at least rumors, a political aspiration, has nosed his machine up alongside Earnhardt, number 27 on the charge. Cale Yarborough trying to pick up a spot on Earnhardt, but Earnhardt says no, and the Valvoline Buick of Cale Yarborough settles back into that third spot. Well, this particular racetrack through the last 12 years that it has been in existence has proven to be quite a test for the competitors in grand national competition. It has provided quite a variety of winners over the 12 years that this race has been run. Something like 11 different drivers have carried the checkered flag following this particular event. So even though the track is reasonably easy, believe it or not, to drive on, it's a tough place to win. Now, I might expound on what I mean by easy to drive on. The competitors say that once you get out there at the speed, the way the Grand National Cars of 1981 are built, they actually handle quite at ease, and it's pretty easy to handle one of the cars around the racetrack. But you have to pay close attention. You have to have respect for the kinds of things that might happen, respect for the consequences, and you have to drive a heavy race to be near the front when the checkered flag drops. We're getting a confirmation from scoring now as the squabble continues over third spot. Rick Wilson is being scored as a lap down. Wilson has has lost a lap during the course of all the pit stops and shuffling here. The four yellow flags that have marred this race, the demolition derby that has been in 1981, Winston 500 thus far. So Rick Wilson was running with that lead draft and definitely demonstrating the driving skill to draft at 200 miles an hour in Talladega, has lost a lap in the pit. 60 laps in the book. In the Winston 500, the leader is Buddy Baker. In second spot is Dale Earnhardt. In third position, after 60, Cale Yarborough. Fourth spot, the property of Darrell Waltrip. Riding fifth, Ricky Rudd. In sixth position, Bobby Allison, who's been at the tail end of that draft for a long time now. Ever since he went back under green, and he seems content to stay right there. Seventh spot, the property of Mike Alexander, the rookie who qualified third fastest. In eighth position is Terry Labonte, who's been racing with Alexander over that spot. Then moving up through traffic. Ninth position belongs to Donnie Allison. Rounding out the top ten, Richard Childress. And the speed, well, the 
record was 184 and a half miles an hour. Old Pete Hamilton on that pad. Remember Pete Hamilton and all the great years that he had here at Talladega as he emerged as just a, a giant star almost overnight in this sport. Hamilton set the record at 185 and a half miles an hour. We've averaged 114. Sunday drive for these guys. One of the few Yankee invaders who really broke into the inner circle of Grand National Stock Car Racing. We have just run down for you the current leaders of the race, and if you're just joining us, we had a rash of yellow fever in the early part of this race. We had several caution flags. Those caution flags were the result of at least two crashes, and among the top contenders knocked out of this race in the early going were Harry Gant, Benny Parsons, Richard Petty, King Richard Petty out, Jody Ridley, and Neil Bonnet. There are several other cars that have also dropped out, and we will be running those down for you in just a brief few moments. 28 cars still running in the race of a field of 40 that got underway here that took the green flag initially, but that green flag was very brief. It was on the second lap, but eight cars tangled and knocked out. And we've already mentioned some of the early leaders in this race and the real contenders for victory here. We have since run a total of 26 laps of this race under the yellow flag, but now that speed is escalating rapidly in terms of the average as this draft right here comes off turn four, thunders down to put the 64th of 180 eight laps in the book and they have definitely turned up the tab. The field charging around. Still led by Buddy Baker. Baker has been a strong horse here since we went back on green but now Allison is starting to get the bit back in his teeth. See how Allison has gotten out of line. He's down on the inside. He's out of the draft but he's still able to move up and that's pretty impressive. Well, it, it was a very interesting move. I don't know how he, how he was able to, to, to maintain velocity that time going down the back stretch. It appeared that nobody was really assisting him in the draft, and the ponies are up. I'll tell you, in the Allison machine, he is able to stick right there on the low side all by himself. I think lap traffic now is going to hinder him, though. Very close going through the tri-oval as the seven leaders there go around some slower cars, and Bobby Allison was able to squeeze between two competitors and kind of thread the needle and get back in line. I'll tell you what, it takes nerve to make that kind of move, but I think we should point out that we've seen something significant right there in that Allison was able to pull down out of the draft, breathe the car, get that cooling air into the engine, and not get drop back, drop kicked all the way back through as we've seen happen earlier. And now, here is Waltrip, and Waltrip is taking Allison with him as he goes after the leader, Buddy Baker. Waltrip again gets up side by side with Dale Earnhardt. Here comes Allison looking to the low side. He wanted to go three abreast down there. Allison has an excellent handling automobile here today. It is still Buddy Baker, the leader. Earnhardt is second, and now up to third spot goes Waltrip, and Allison is just working that first side of the race track up in fear. I don't know if those of you at home caught it or not, but there was an anxious moment as they went through the trioval. Dave, you explained that a little earlier as probably the most precarious spot on this racetrack as far as keeping these high-powered race cars 600 plus horsepower under control and it appeared to be Ricky Rudd, Cal Yarbrough and Donnie and Bobby Allison coming very close. There goes Bobby Allison, speaking of Allison, going by one car, now going to the low side of Earnhardt. Earnhardt in just a little faster groove as they go through the north banking. Dale Earnhardt with the damaged nose on that race car, apparently having no problem keeping the car sticking on the track where he wants it to go and making it remain stable and running that arrow straight line. And Buddy Baker works the 67th of 188 laps that were comprised of the Winston 500, Bobby Allison is the guy who is creating a lot of the fireworks. Controversy has surrounded that team all year long. They brought the Le Mans automobile to Daytona. They showed up with a surprise car, a car that was legal under the NASCAR rule book, but it was a car that was so aerodynamically superior to the rest of the field, and they made changes in the spoiler rules to accommodate that automobile. And Allison was finally forced to park that car and climb in a Buick. And now in that Buick here today, Allison is demonstrating his ability to run down on the low side of the racetrack and run there very effectively. Buddy Baker leading Dale Earnhardt. Waltrip riding in that third spot. Allison dropping back a little bit now, but more importantly, testing the entire racing surface and showing that he can run anywhere. Car number 24 is rolling toward pit lane. Cecil Gordon apparently with an unpredicted pit stop. 
rolling a little more slowly than we are accustomed to seeing cars come in. Back to the leaders now. There's Buddy Baker, Dale Earnhardt, and Cal Yarborough. One, two, three. Down what appears to be on your television screen, a flat back stretch. It is basically flat, although there are a few degrees of banking there, but it just kind of suffers by comparison when you look. And there goes Dale Earnhardt into the lead for the first time. Dale Earnhardt breaks from the Buddy Baker draft, moves well out in front, and Baker, it looks like he may be slowing down, maybe he's preparing to pit, Dave. It's about time for these guys to start looking at tire stops at a deed. We're going to see it. Here comes Earnhardt, Allison ducking in. They, I think, saw Buddy Baker planning to come in and decided, hey, if we're going in, let's all go in together. Because once we get all split up out there, then the draft is going to go away. We've got a host of leaders rumbling down onto pit road. Earnhardt in and out very quickly, barely stopped that automobile. Now it's getting his work here with Buddy Baker, the leader. Most of the green flag traffic jam. The fastest service in the world. In and out in 15 seconds. And we're going to see a jump in the deck here. First of the day's green flag pit stop. Here they come drag racing back out onto the course. Without a doubt, probably the finest pit the NASCAR Grand National Crews, they were the first ones to really start building reputation as being the single best when it comes to efficiency in terms of service and pitting. And boy, they've just gotten better through the years. They even have a pit stop contest. Now, Darrell Walter coming in, the two crew will be bolting over the wall and giving service to the number 11 race car. Walter up the last of the leaders to pit under this green flag. The green remains out, so if all things remain as they are, Walter should have an opportunity to exit pit road and come back out with the leader. That's going to be the key for Walter. He, he must get out there and time his return to the racetrack. Hopefully it's time to catch up with that lead draft as they come thundering back down around. There is the new crew machine. Charger. Meanwhile, the number 52 car of Jimmy Means is showing smoke, and he's obviously in trouble. That lead draft has been broken up into two twosomes now, and Walter will get back out onto the racetrack in this spot. Bad break for Jimmy Means, who takes his car behind the wall. Means from Huntsville, Alabama. There's Terry Labonte and car number 77, that brand new Harry Hyde creation of Johnny Allison. It appears as though that that duo is also getting ready to come in for a pit stop. It's about scheduled time for them. Here comes the Texan and the Alabama coming into pit road. You have to stretch these cars to get 100 miles out of the tank of fuel. Under the green flag, and now you see the second echelon coming in. There is Labonte in for his service. That for seventh and eighth spot between Mike Alexander and Terry Labonte and Donnie Allison. That. Now that's going to pick up right where it left off. So the field is back under green, remaining under green this time. Lap 40. We are working lap 71 of the 188 laps that will make up the 500 mile distance here. Labonte heading back out into the fray. That's young Labonte going back out. Labonte has only been in one other Winston 500. He started 19th and did not finish the race a year ago. There were the leaders, Bobby Allison in car number 28 and Dale Earnhardt in number 2. And as Dave pointed out to you, they are out alone now. They have broken from the remainder the remainder of the leaders in this race. And if Earnhardt and Allison can stay in that configuration for 20 to 25 green flag laps, they may be sharing first and second place for the rest of the afternoon. Well, they have shuffled the deck significantly here with the first of our green stop pit, uh, green flag pit stop. Allison and Earnhardt have quickly come back out to the four. But the record book will show that Terry Labonte led the 70th lap, the 70 lap run down showing Labonte out front. And at that moment, the number 77 car, Donnie Allison, was in the number two spot. But again, that was the case when all the leaders were back. We see the interval back to the third and fourth place battle now of Cale Yarborough and the number 88 machine of Ricky Rudd. And back in fifth spot is Darrell Waltrip, who we saw go drag racing out there trying to catch that lead draft. Back up to the lead battle as Allison leads Earnhardt around this race track. I don't think we can make too much of the Friday and Saturday happenings here. Everybody was a little leery about the draft. These are downsized automobiles. We'll explain that a little more in a moment. We've got downsized cars. They're smaller configurations than what we've seen in the past. They react differently, and this is the first time that the cars have appeared at Talladega. So everyone was a little spooky about getting out there and running together, and then these two guys went out and did it. They ran 205 miles an hour in the draft, and now they're leading the Winston 500. Bobby Allison is your leader. Dale Earnhardt rides in the number two spot, sitting third is Cale Yarborough, and 
We'll be back with more in a moment. Alabama Motor Speedway, while we were away, the yellow flag came out for the fifth time today. The record for this race is nine yellow yellow flags back in 72 and as we approach the midway point of 94 laps that record is very much in doubt here today could be broken as we've seen a crash and engine blown marred 500 mile battle here we are 82 laps into the winston 500 a 188 lap battle and we're just about ready for a restart the 80 lap rundown will go into the book with dale earnhardt shown as the leader and earnhardt will in fact hold that lead as we come back to green Buddy Baker has moved up into the number two position after the shuffle of pit stops. This yellow was brought out by two blown engines. First, Rick Wilson's engine let go. He brought out his second spot the flag of the day. And during the yellow flag, Ronnie Thomas blew an engine, so they're both out of the action here today. Ronnie's uh, pit crew, crew chief is Jade Thomas, and that's one of two father-son combinations. The Arrington crew, the roles are reversed. Joey Arrington is the crew chief for his father, Buddy. But in any case, now Ronnie Thomas is out of it. The track has been cleaned up, and we're just about set to go back to green flag racing. The race average for 80 laps was 125.7 miles an hour, way down from the record of 175 set in 1977. The Pontiac Pace Car has gone on pit road. The leaders are rumbling down the front straightaway into the tri-oval, and they're looking for that flicker of green from the official race starter. the Winston 500. The green is out, and they're underway. Thundering down toward turn one. Earnhardt takes to the top of the racetrack. Buddy Baker comes down low. Baker has grabbed the lead. Allison comes right with him. It is Buddy Baker, Bobby Allison, Dale Earnhardt running in that top three spots as they go hurtling down the back chute. Ricky Rudd is right there in the thick of it. Darrell Waltrip is running in the fifth spot. And that draft is hooked right back up again. Larry, we're back to the 200 position. We, we watch the leaders changing position for the umpteenth time today, and there'll be several more of those as we complete the final half of this race. We're coming up on the halfway point in just a few minutes. You know, the color of NASCAR Grand National Stock Car Racing in 1981 has to be green. Several green cars have surfaced in this series in the 1981 season. The Skull Bandit team came out except with green colors. Ricky Rudd, number 88 Gatorade cars, of course green. The Mountain Dew car, Junior Johnson, number 11, Darrell Waldrop, the fifth one, the far right hand screen, far right hand part of your screen right now. That car is green. Donnie Allison's new ride even has green and orange on it. Now these cars are downsized as we see Buddy Baker there in the Red Uno sponsored number one go to the inside of the draft to pick up some position. These cars are downsized for this season. NASCAR has always made an effort to respond to what is rolling off of the assembly lines in Detroit, and NASCAR certainly has done that again here at 1981. There was a significant problem with the stability of these machines when they roared into the high banks at Daytona International Speedway in February, and since that time, these 3,700-pound race cars have been allowed to add spoilers onto the tail trunk lid of these cars to give them more stability in the turn. The new rules require that the cars have a 110-inch wheelbase, a 62-inch tread for the tires. The cubic inch displacement is now allowed up to 355 cubic inches, and the only type of fuel-air mixture allowed is one four-barrel carburetor. Here's Buddy Baker on the move. Big Buddy, who's won four times here at Talladega and loves to lead, is alongside Dale Earnhardt in the battle for second place. They are chasing Bobby Allison. Ricky Rudd is tucked right in behind him in fourth spot. Baker cannot get the nose around Earnhardt as they come to the trial, but they almost touch fenders. Boy, you've got to have a lot of faith in your fellow driver to make that kind of move through that 18-degree banking. Here is Allison thundering into turn one, and he takes advantage as the leaders go three and try to go four deep through turn one. Allison squirts up a little bit. Cale Yarborough making a daring move on the low side. Buddy Baker is the meat in a sandwich between Rudd and Yarborough. Wow! Cale Yarborough made the move on the low side. They got three abreast. They sorted themselves back out going down the back street. That's the kind of competition that has drawn a capacity crowd to every NASCAR Grand National race this year. Well, young Ricky Rudd was on the high side, and he had to be spending more time looking due to the left that time 
looking to the west as he came out of the number two corner looking at both Yarbrough and Buddy Baker on the inside of him. It looked for a moment that they didn't touch. They were darn close to touching. Even though Rudd is one of the younger drivers on the Grand National Trail, this is his fifth, believe it or not, Winston 500 here at Talladega. He has never finished one of these races. He has always qualified well in the upper half of the field, but he's hoping for his first top ten and maybe even first victory ever on the Grand National Trail here today. Now, they may have shaken each other up a little bit. A little more conservative trip down the back stretch this time through. Number 27 car. We'll get a double check on that report as we watch the leaders come hurtling through this first. Furnished by Major League. Buddy Baker riding in that third spot. And Rudd and Waltrip continue their squabble over fourth and fifth. And now you see them tightening it right back up again. The draft is so effective here. Nobody can afford to let those guys get away. The number 27 car of Dale Yarborough has fallen out of that pack. And that car is reported headed for the garage area. Yarborough, who made such a daring move right in this vicinity of the racetrack just two laps ago, has now suddenly paid a mechanical penalty. His car is headed behind the wall. Bad break for the three-time Grand National Champion. Well, Cale is also the third leading money winner of all time at this racetrack, having won almost $200,000. He was the winner of the Winston 500 in 1978. And prior to that season, he had led into that year with two consecutive second-place finishes. So one of the most successful drivers in the history of this race has just retired, Cale Yarborough. A remarkable mix of Grand National superstar stories out there in that Legion Top 5 car draft. Bobby Allison, who has never won the Grand National Championship, and is so serious about it this year, currently leading the way. mentioned earlier the controversy in which uh, Bobby Allison has been embroiled throughout this started well back in the field about 37th or 38th position there you see buddy baker that bright red number one car going to the inside of defending national champion gail earnhardt they're battling for second position ronnie thomas who we saw drop out of the race just a couple of seconds ago he started in 37th or 38th position he was hoping to win there's ronnie thomas he was hoping to win the award that they are presenting today i think it's a five thousand dollar prize that goes with it for the most improved position in the race he told me yesterday he had it in the bag an hour and they have indeed here for Ronnie Thomas as he retired perhaps more significantly in terms of the great finish Cale Yarborough going behind the wall and Yarborough definitely had to be considered a factor of potential winner in this race. 90 laps have been complete we are approaching the midway point which will come at lap 94 so the leaders are working the approaching the halfway mark and they jump on the deck as Buddy Baker works into the lead he took Dale Earnhardt with him in the draft back in the third spot. L.Z. Wiley Baker, Buddy Baker, third, uh, second generation driver. His daddy, Buck, was one of the greats in NASCAR racing during his seminal years when this kind of competition was just getting its start. Buddy Baker has certainly emerged as one of this sport's great star teams and other drivers who's never won the Grand National Championship. Dale Earnhardt's father is another great racing name from the past. He never really made a name for himself on the Grand National Trail by many as one of the greatest short track dirt drivers in the history of grand national racing two or three times he was the national champion in the late model sportsman division so dale earnhardt like buddy baker comes from a very rich and strong tradition of racing heritage and both of these gentlemen are running in first and second position right now well this sport is all they've ever known their entire lives they've been at racetrack it's been the only thing that's been the focal point of their family's lives the whole time that both Buddy Baker and Dale Earnhardt have been on the face of this earth. An excellent look at the first five here as the first 90 laps of this race go into the book. We're going to go back and take a look here at the 6th, 7th, 8th, and ninth place battle. Terry Levante is currently on the point in that four-car draft. He is being pursued by number 77, Don Allison, the brother of one of our leaders here. Also in the second that is the number 37 car of Mike Alexander, that rookie. Back up front, Buddy Baker leading Dale and the third place driver trying to take over the second spot now and doing so is Bobby Allison. Continuing that 90 lap rundown, the fourth place driver at 90 
was the number 11 machine. That's Darrell Waltrip. Running in fifth spot was the number 88 car of Ricky Rudd. Then sixth, Labonte. Seventh was Donnie Allison. Eighth was the rookie driver, number 37, Alexander. And those cars were all on the lead lap. Allison and Baker going side by side for the lead. If they come down through the tri-oval, yet another time. A lap back in ninth spot, the number 47 car of Ron Bouchard, who has been up with that lead draft very much of the running with Labonte and Donnie Allison and rounding out the top 10 in the running order, Richard Children after 90 laps. The speed picking up a little bit, 127 miles an hour average. The record in 1977 is Gerald Walters, 176. So we're nowhere near record speed today, but we've seen record action and all the time we've been running under green. You know, Dave, while you were sitting there giving the rundown, I was sitting here thinking, the only thing that's a shame about this racetrack, which was constructed in 1969, and and what an engineering masterpiece it is, built exclusively for speed. The only thing that's a shame about it is that Fireball, Rex, Little Joe, Fonny Fox, Buddy Schumann, people like that never had an opportunity to run here. Couldn't you just imagine seeing those great racing names in the past rocketing around the 33-degree banking, guys who started out in quarter-mile dirt track, guys that legend would have it, actually started out as moonshiners. Can you imagine them, what they would think if they were able to suddenly drop in and view this racetrack today? We have reached the midway point in the Winston 500, and Buddy Baker has just picked up $5,000 for leading the 94th of 188 laps in this race. Baker, a charger who will always go to the front, a man who has picked up a reputation as being hard on automobiles, hard on equipment because of the way he drives it. Baker will put that foot down and go to the front time after time after time all day long, four times. The car has held together here at Talladega, and he has won the race. He has teamed this year with Haas Ellington and the Uno Buick, and Baker says that this year he's got a good car underneath him. Haas Ellington says, I can build a car strong enough for Buddy Baker, and right now that car is leading this 500-mile grind. But boy, does he have competition. Dale Earnhardt is right on his rear deck. In that number two spot, Bobby Allison seems to at this moment to sit in third. There is Terry Labonte, who is leading the second wave of drivers here, leading Donnie Allison in the race for seventh, eighth, and ninth positions. Ron Bouchard is also in that draft, but he is a lap down. Helping us in the booth today keep track of what's going on as we look back at the leaders is Richie Panch himself, currently, I guess we should say, a Grand National driver looking for a ride. Richie, at this stage in the race when things have kind of calmed down, how much communication is actually going on between the drivers and the people down pit road? There is very little communication at this time. Drivers are just out there doing their own thing, waiting for the crews to tell them when to pit. And the only time the drivers will contact the pits is if they have a problem with the cars. But so right now, there's virtually no communication between the drivers and the crew. Now, at this point in the race, fuel consumption also becomes a very significant factor. Do you, as the driver, have a feel for just what kind of mileage you're getting? No, you don't. You totally rely on the pits. You have too much to worry about when you're out there yourself. And you're completely in reliance on the pits to tell you when to come in. Also, I know that concentration is a big part of being out on this racetrack at these super fast speeds and in the midpoint of the race, you've been out there running for 30, 35 minutes at these speeds. It becomes almost a casual atmosphere. Are there tricks that a driver has to play on himself to keep himself alert? Uh, you have to concentrate at all times. Sometimes you get in a lull and you're just out there riding and you realize that, hey, this isn't going to get it. So something snaps and you get back in the groove of things, but you do have to concentrate every lap if you're going to be up there, especially the front leaders worrying about what the other drivers are going to do. And it's just something that you have to just train yourself to do. Well, Richie, thanks very much for the insight. It's uh, something that people like Dave Despain and I can't really call up on, the actual experience of having been out there, and we appreciate your comments very much. Richie, we wish you good luck, too, in your Grand National Aspiration Son, one of the legends that you referred to earlier, Larry. Big Marvin Pan, former Daytona 500 winner. Well, in terms of brands here, as the lead five thunder through the 33 degree bank of turn one and two at Talladega, the world's fastest motor speedway, there is the Uno Buick of Buddy Baker out front and close on his heels, the Wrangler Pontiac of Dale Earnhardt. The third place car, Bobby Allison, and another Buick, that's the five racers Buick. That's the car that took the place of the controversial Pontiac Le Mans 
was such a big story in Daytona this year and has been in fact through the first half dozen races on the Winston Cup Trail. The fourth place machine, Darrell Waltrip's Mountain Dew Buick, and the fifth place automobile, Ricky Rudd, that's the number 88 car, and that is an Oldsmobile. The lead five, thundering around the last lap at 198 miles per hour. This is the kind of action that we expected here in this wreck marred yellow flag guard with some 500. We'll be back with more action in just a moment. Complete in the Winston 500, 266 miles down. In this 500-mile battle, we are just past the midway point. The big story thus far today has been the accidents and the blown engines that have brought out the yellow flag five times in the event for a total of 30 laps, and it has slowed the race average down significantly. But now that they are back under green, we're seeing the 198-mile-an-hour speeds that we had anticipated. Among those who were knocked out of the race in the very early stages by virtue of a crash in Included Harry Grant, one of the pre-race favorites, a big favorite in the South, Benny Parsons, originally a taxi cab driver from Detroit who spent the past decade here in the South running Grand National stock cars. The all-time king of this sport, Richard Petty, involved in a third lap crash. Connie Saylor, for the second time in a row this year in a super speedway, involved in a crash. No injury among all these drivers. Bill Elliott, who has performed quite well this year. Stan Barrett, the Hollywood stuntman. Neil Bonnet, not involved in a crash, but a victim of mechanical problems early on in the race with a hole in his oil pan. Rick Newsom out with mechanical wolves. J.D. McDuffie, one of the regulars on the Winston Trail, a blowing engine. Kyle Petty in and out of the pit several times before calling it a day. And the most recent victims with mechanical problems underneath the hood, Jimmy Means, Rick Wilson, who qualified so well here today and ran among the leaders for the first 30 laps, Ronnie Thomas, and the veteran Kale Yarborough. As this lead five-car draft continues to thunder around this racetrack, we'll be looking at the possibility of only the second green flag pit stop of the day. And that would be an appropriate time to mention that the pit three here, led by some of the masterful names in car and engine building and the entire world of motorsports, are having their own competition within the race today. That is the Sears National Pitchers Championship, the Craftsman Pit uh, Competition that involves the 10 fastest overall qualifiers in the race. And their total time on pit road during the course of the event is recorded. And the car that spends the least time in the pit wins a $2,100 award for this race and points for the $25,000 Seasons Championship in Pitchers Competition. So that's an interesting element of this to come into play here within the next few laps if the green stays out. You know, we also take for granted these pit stops. We watch the crews form over the wall as cars come into the pit and watch them manhandle those tires and those gas tanks. As we look at Terry Labonte, who has just been passed by Donnie Allison. Donnie Allison has been following Labonte for at least 30 or 40 laps of this race. They've been hooked up in a draft, and Allison and the brand-new ride for him for this race has gotten around the young racer, Terry Labonte, who won at Darlington last year in a surprise victory when the leaders crashed in the final lap. Ron Bouchard, the New Englander, is in that yellow and white number 47 behind that duo. Bouchard is one lap down, but hooked up in the draft with Donnie Allison and Terry Labonte. I was about to comment about being about taking for granted pit stops. You know those big mounted tires and wheels that come flying over the wall along with those gas tanks? Each of those weigh about 90 pounds a piece. And one crewman manhandles those things and they sling them around like, well, they were baby carriages or something. Well, the crews on all five of these automobiles will be getting an opportunity to do that very shortly as we approach a scheduled pit stop here with Buddy Baker leading the Winston 500 over Dale Earnhardt. You see Allison again working down in that low groove. Allison has tried that part of the racetrack all day long and seems to have the most effective car down low. That's critical because so often at Talladega we've seen two, three, sometimes four cars come off the fourth turn for the final time charging toward the checkered flag. And then you've got to know where on the racetrack your car will work. And Allison has tried every groove out there today. Buddy Baker leading Dale Earnhardt as they sweep around Dave Marcus' last automobile. Walter is third, Rudd is fourth, and Allison fifth. As we look at Marcus's car, the light blue car that just went out of your pictures as the leaders stream by on the high side, there's a graphic example of what a difference seven or eight years in equipment can make. Dave Marcus was one of the most successful drivers at this racetrack in the mid-70s when he was running with top equipment, and now Marcus is struggling just to stay into the race. 
Well, for an update on what's happening on Pit Road in anticipation of the stop, let's go down to Ned Jarrett. Well, you were talking about those pit stops and the competition. We're at the board where they keep track of that. Right now, Darrell Walter crew, headed up by Tim Brewer, is leading the pit stop competition. They've only spent 115.28 seconds in the pits. In second place right now is Ricky Rudge, car number 88, with Cliff Champion as the crew chief. They've been in the pits for a total of 181.36 seconds. And Mike Alexander in the car number 37 with J.C. Elder as the crew chief has been in for 212 seconds. So very close competition in the pit action here today. And as you say, those next pit stops, which will be coming up before too long, will be very critical here in the Thank you, Ned Jarrett. We anticipate about eight more laps before the leaders come into the pit. At 100 laps, the running order saw that lead five-car draft right out front. They've rearranged the pieces of that draft a little bit since then, but nothing significant of the show. Baker, Earnhardt, Waltrip, Rudd, and Allison in the first five spots. At 100 laps, Terry Labonte was in sixth spot. He has subsequently been passed by Donnie Allison, but they continue to swap sixth and seventh. They were involved. There is Labonte. Labonte, who continues to try to move up and catch that lead draft, but that's going to be very difficult to do. Perhaps the pit stop would help him. Labonte now being shown in seventh spot as Allison has moved around him. The eighth position belongs to the rookie driver, the number 37 car that started third here, Mike Alexander's machine. Ninth is number 47 of Ron Bouchard. And the 10th place automobile, Richard Childress, 131 miles an hour at 100 laps as they pick up the tempo. The lead five working through the 33-degree banking. That's the highest banking in the world of motorsports. And it makes turns one and two, and then at the north end of the speedway, turns three and four. Very much like a straightaway in terms of what the driver has to do on that part of the racetrack. The car, if it's set up properly, will steer neutral through that part of the racetrack. The G-forces, though, are tremendous. They just mash the driver down into the seat, and they make it one of the most challenging bits of competition anywhere in motorsports. The drivers say that as you enter the turns, particularly one and three, your head and eyes are telling you get off the accelerator, find the brake, or at least slow down, but you know that your foot is saying stay there, and the first few times you go out into the super speedway, you can't believe that the car sticks at 190, 195 miles an hour going through what essentially is a 180 degree turn. But they do, the corners here are nice and wide, there's lots of room to race. The actual racing groove is about three car lanes wide, and it's a racetrack, as we mentioned earlier, that is just perfectly designed for high speed, super speedway, Grand National stock car racing. The lead five working their way. Here is that second draft now. This is the sixth, seventh, and eighth place race. And Terry Labonte has moved back around Donnie Allison to retake six spots and kicked Allison back to seventh. That is now just a two-car draft because Mike Anderson has dropped out of that battle. He had held the spot, or Mike Alexander, rather, who had been involved in that three-car draft early, has now dropped back out of it. And he is still shown in eighth position, but has lost the draft on those two very fast cars. Right there, Terry Labonte and Donnie Allison working with lap traffic, but that pack also including Bouchard, who has shown eight. The lead five, thunder around, and on pit road, the anticipation begins to build as a huge throng who have gathered here, approaching 100,000 fans, drawn by the excitement, the power, the thunder of these race cars as they hurtle down the back track. We saw 205 mile an hour laps in the draft, in practice and preparation for this race, and we have consistently, under green, seen 198 and 199 mile per hour laps here this afternoon, and out front through much of that has been Buddy Baker, one of 10 men to lead this race today. As we look at the leaders headed up by Buddy Baker, might inform you that the second pack of cars, which is now dwindled to two, just Terry Labonte, and Johnny Allison is just 10.7 seconds behind the lead herd of five machines. So even though we haven't seen much of Donnie and Terry Labonte in the last 20 or 30 green flag laps, they're still very much in contention, just 10 seconds behind one good pit stop on behalf of the crew of either Labonte or Donnie Allison, and they would be plunked right down in the middle of that pack of snarling five race cars you see on your screen right now. Again, as we prepare to approach the pit stop, let's find out what's happening down there in anticipation of those stops from Ned Jarrett. We're standing in Buddy Baker's pits, and they're planning for him to come in within the next five laps. They would plan, of course, to fill it up with gasoline and change the right side tires only. Side tires during that last caution period. The left side tires do not get as much wear and as much strain as the right side tires, so they're ready for him at about four miles left. Go 
Cody Renly has returned to the racetrack, and he has unretired himself, Larry. Unretired, he returns Stan, Hood, Will, and at least half of the right... ...involved in that second last crash up in the north banking, the third turn, you can see, it looks almost like a short track stock car rather than a grand national piece of equipment. No hood, no grill. Jody Ridley out to get some points. Jody Ridley is one of those drivers who was working real hard to pick up valuable experience in the super speedways. He was the rookie of the year a year ago. As the lead five thunder down, it is Buddy Baker leading the way. This is the trickiest part of the racetrack right here. That part of the track is banked at 18 degrees, unlike the high banks of turns one, two, turn three, and four. Only an 18 degree bank, but they go through there just as fast as they do through the turn. That is the tricky part of the racetrack, and that's where those last lap charges are so critical. The lead five still, Buddy Baker, Dale Earnhardt has been kicked back in that pack. There is Ridley. He's coming around slowly, and you get a good look there at the damage that has been done to that automobile. It's been a brutal afternoon in terms of what's been happening to the equipment here. Now, the deck is shuffled again. Waltrip has taken the lead. Allison is second. Baker is third. Earnhardt fourth. And back in fifth spot, the number 88 machine of Ricky Rudd. And we would anticipate that those pit stops are going to be coming up very shortly. An interesting piece of strategy. You know, Waltrip hasn't led for a long time, and he just showed us that he, like the other four cars in that pack, apparently has the ability to move to the front when he wants to. Now, the only driver in that pack who now has not led in the past 30 laps is Ricky Rudd, who is the very last car, the fifth car, the far right-hand side of your screen right now. But you wonder if Waltrip has moved to the front, maybe thinking that if he's ready to pit, he will have a clearer track to slow down, better vision to get into the pit area. Watch for Darrell Waltrip, among the other leaders, to come in very shortly. It's going to be very interesting to see if they all come in together, too, and keep this draft intact, or if they'll break up the draft on the pit stop. Preliminary indication that Buddy Baker may be coming in this time, but he stays up in the draft, so perhaps another lap. But it's going to be very interesting to see whether they all five come in together. As we watch these five cars, all of them now veterans of super speedway racing and grand national racing, Although a couple of them, Dale Earnhardt and Ricky Rudd, have only been around for about five years. Dale Earnhardt's been in just his third season. Earnhardt has not won one of these spring races here at Talladega, nor has Ricky Rudd, the other three drivers in that lead draft. Buddy Baker has won three spring races at Talladega. Darrell Waltrip won, and Bobby Allison, who just now is moving into the lead, also has won one of these races. Mike Alexander, the first of the top ten to pit. Alexander, who had run with the leaders of the early draft has now come in and out of the pits and is back out there. Looks like Earnhardt is going to be the first one in. Dale Earnhardt has peeled out of line. Earnhardt is headed for pit road. He's going to let the other four leaders go. Daryl Earnhardt, the Grand National Champion, thunders the Wrangler Oldsmobile. Check out the Wrangler Pontiac. Down pit road, locks up the rear wheels, almost overshot the pit. Well, I don't know if he hit it on a dime. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know if he hit it on a dime, David. Just got lucky. He really did. Thunder was a good word. He came in a little quicker than what he would like to. And he gets the rubber off that tire when he stops. I was going to say, I bet he does so when he takes off. Look at him. He looks like a drag racer. 16 seconds on the pit stop, and Dale Earnhardt is back out now. The question becomes: the other leaders certainly will have to pit soon. When they pit, will Earnhardt gain ground on the racetrack? Here they come in. Bright red car of Buddy Baker. Looks like the two green cars of Waltrip and Rudd. And there's the black and silver machine of Bobby Allison. We will be watching very closely now as these crews work on these race cars. These four cars undoubtedly will get out just about at the same time. The question becomes as we get a close-up shot of Bobby Allison's crew. Buddy Baker sitting in his car getting a drink of water. That 90-pound gas can hoisted high above the left rear fender. Another drink going in for this thirsty race car. Let's go to Ned Jarrett for a more of the shot. The team of Hot Rod is ended up the gap, but he does have a clutch problem, and he was able to get away very quickly there, so the clutch must not have bothered him this time. That's important for Baker, who was able to get back out quickly. The clutch problems apparently did not recur on that stop, and the Uno team is happy about that. We had a close call in pit row. The man right in the middle of your screen who just put the hat on almost got hit by Ricky Rudd. Ricky Rudd pulled out of his pit space, didn't see that Uno crew member standing right in front of him. Rudd burned rubber through Buddy Baker's pit, 
stall area and almost hit one of the crewmen. Well, fortunately, everybody came out of that okay, and now the five lead automobiles have all been in to replenish themselves on lap 118. We anticipate that we'll see the rest of them come in, and here is Donnie Allison right now. Allison brings the Harry Hyde prepared, number 77 in. Donnie Allison from Hueytown, Alabama, is giving up the lead, which he had held for the brief span of one lap while all the leaders came in. So Allison had the lead for a lap, has now given it up as he comes in for his obligatory pit stop. The Harry Hyde crew quickly going to work on that automobile. He's in and back out. You know, Allison is one of those guys who, although he hasn't had terrible luck, you just get the feeling he could have had better luck in all the years of being the Grand National Racer. He, of course, is the brother of Bobby Allison, who has had tremendous success racing not only Grand National Racing, but also many of the short tracks around the country. The best finish that Donnie has ever had in this race here at Talladega was the very first one he entered back in 1973 when he started the race in 17th position and netted a second place. He's also had a fourth in 1977 and a seventh in 1976. As we get back to action, after the flurry of pit stops, Bobby Allison has reasserted himself, retaking the lead over Darrell Waltrip. And Allison and Waltrip got back out together and have hooked right back up in the draft. So it is Allison and Waltrip who will lead it down into turn number one. They've got a healthy advantage over the number three car for seconds. Back to Dale Earnhardt, who is third. Fourth place man, Buddy Baker, who is right there running with Earnhardt. But the story now is the quick stop. Here's more work on the number 90, Jody Ridley, Rookie of the Year last year in Grand National Competition. The Sunny King machine, the Rushmore car, getting work in the pits. He's had a tremendous amount of damage on that car after that big crash early in the race that took out the likes of Benny Parsons and Richard Petty, Harry Gant, some of the drivers who were considered among the 20 men with a realistic shot at winning this thing here today. Well, the big story now is going to be whether this draft of Buddy Baker and Dale Earnhardt can get these two men, Bobby Allison and Darrell Waltrip, as Waltrip is right on the rear deck of Allison in the race for first and second. What was a five-car draft has now broken up into two twosomes, and all by himself out there is Ricky Rudd. That's going to be tough for him running in fifth spot to try to catch up with nobody to draft on those. Well, we've completed 120 laps of this race. We've got 68 laps to go, so... Whereas the pit stops certainly play a role in the strategy as the race is unfolding right at this moment, the next two spots stops are really the crucial ones. So even though at least three of the competitors lost ground at that duo right there of Bobby Allison and Darrell Waltrip, they still have two more pit stops with which to make up some lost time. 120 laps, 319 miles complete. In this, the Winston 500, the leader, Bobby Allison, second, Darrell Waltrip. There is the third and fourth place battle, Buddy Baker and Dale Earnhardt. And we'll be back with more action in a moment. We're back to action at Alabama International Motor Speedway, and it's like a rerun of the earlier action because we've again got a four-car battle for the lead with Buddy Baker out front and Dale Earnhardt grabbing that number two spot significantly here while we were away the draft of baker and earnhardt successful in running down from behind the draft that had been leading the race bobby allison now third and daryl walter fourth and larry they just went blitzing right around the outside and reasserted themselves as in command here obviously allison and walter were able to hold on to that draft but it was an impressive performance it was a big surprise it started out about a 10 second differential between the first draft and the second draft and they moved down the interval about two to three seconds a lap or so it seemed the last couple of laps before they caught him and baker showed us a lot of strength there's the fifth place car of ricky rudd the gatorade machine now rudd is about a quarter of a lap behind the first four cars now going back to the cars running in sixth and seventh position that place car of Donnie Allison, the orange and green trim, number 77, and the seventh place car of Texan Terry Labonte. The car right behind him is Ron Bouchard. He's been running with Allison and Labonte most of the day. He is, a, he is one lap down to the leaders in the top ten, I believe, but not on the same lap with the number one car. In uh, ninth position officially for Ron Bouchard, the short track modified specialist car number 47. 
That, of course, is the old Harry Gant ride before Gant climbed into Skull Bandit, only to make a couple of laps here before he crashed today and was knocked out of the race. Meanwhile, the lead battle, now a four-car fray. You remember that number 88, Ricky Rudd, had been in that five-car draft prior to the glorious pit stop. He had a little longer stop, and it cost him the opportunity. Sixth and seventh, still very much a story. As Donnie Allison and Kerry Levante have demonstrated the ability to keep uh, to uh, catch up, or at least to keep up with those leaders. And the point there, I think, is that if we see another yellow flag, and we've had five already, with a bunch of these guys right back up, and those two cars could have a shot at hanging on to that lead draft. Back up front, Buddy Baker. Out front, Baker, who has been so strong all day and, in fact, throughout the history of Alabama International Motor Speedway. He's won four times here. Three times in the Winston 500 in May and once in the Talladega 500 in August. And no other driver can boast that kind of success on this racetrack. Baker and Earnhardt are stretching it out. They are pulling away from Waltrip and Allison, who is missing way off the pack. Allison is coming on pit road. Allison is in for an unscheduled pit stop. Allison on pit road. They are changing tires on the car. That is definitely not a planned stop. The speculation would be that perhaps there was a problem with one of the tires that they put on on the stop just 20 or so laps to go. That is going to be very difficult for Allison to overcome. They are changing all four tires. All four tires are being changed on that car. Allison is coming back out. He is going to be well out of the fray and, in fact, is going to go a lap down to the leader as they come thundering by. Allison on pit road. Caution flag is coming out right now as Allison comes out of the pit. The leaders just went by Bobby Allison as he exited the pit. You see them going out of your picture right now. There are the leaders. They're now moving into turn two. Again, we are on caution flag. I do not believe we have had an accident. I think we have some debris on the racetrack. Perhaps another engine has let go. But we are under caution. Buddy Baker leads this race. Dale Earnhardt, the defending national champion who has never won here, is running in second position. Bobby Allison just missed getting out of the pits in time. I thought that caution flag might save him. There is Bobby Allison, who is now a lap down to the leader and probably running on the track in seventh or eighth position at this juncture. There are moments in racing careers that live in your memory, things that you think about at night when you wake up and uh, you're rerunning races in your head. And for Bobby Allison, that yellow flag is going to be one that he'll think a lot about. He made that pit stop precisely one lap too soon. Now, here come the leaders into the pits, but they have the advantage of making their pit stops under a yellow flag condition. This yellow has been brought out because of debris on the racetrack. That is confirmed by NASCAR officials. There is the Buddy Baker crew going to work. The Haas Ellington-led group that have put this Uno Buick out front. Uno, of course, is a so very popular. The sponsorship on this automobile as well. Baker has run strong. Now, they have the leisurely opportunity here to change four tires. Junior Johnson and Tim Brewer do the service on that machine. So it's a wholesale shuffle, a pit stop. This stop was scheduled to come at about 150 to 155 laps, but now they're all taking advantage of the yellow, except for Allison, who had to come in a lap before this yellow and has now fallen out of the lead lap. As we watch Buddy Baker as he makes his way back out onto the speedway, one of Baker's other competitors that is still on the racetrack, a fellow we haven't mentioned too much already today is Tim Richmond, Buddy Baker's teammate. There are quite a number of people whom we have not had much of an opportunity to talk about, among which, including Richmond, Dick May is still out there among them. Tommy Houston, the short track star who got a Grand National ride for this weekend. Buddy Arrington, who has been in and out of the pits. He's been a regular on the Grand National Trail for quite some time. Dave Marcus, a man who is a former champion here, not in a competitive car for this racetrack in 1981, although he has had some success on the trail, the Grand National Stock Car Trail, and another speedway, Marcus is still in it. Tommy Gale in Elmo Langley's machine, Bobby Waywack, the invader from the north, originally racing out of Illinois, now living in the south, the former world go-karting champion, Lake Speed, involved in the second last crash, has been up to racing speed the entire race since that time. As we look at Ricky Rudd, who has spent most of the last half hour in fifth position in this race, 
the Gator A team going to work on servicing the number 88 car of Ricky Rudd. Among others, still out in the fray for this, the Winston 500. J.D. McDuffie, he dropped from the race at one point. He has re-entered. Cecil Gordon, Elliott Forbes Robinson, the 40 car set represented by Elliott Forbes Robinson. Jody Ridley competing with about three quarters of a race car and Richard Childress in car number three. Bobby Allison there, he's directly behind the pace car, and he will be a lap down to the leader. When we get back under a green flag condition here, the leader now being shown unofficially at this juncture as indeed Ricky Rudd. It is Rudd who is being shown as the leader. Also in that lead quartet now will be number 11, Darrell Waltham, number 2, Dale Earnhardt, number 1, Buddy Baker. So we'll resume with Bobby Allison, a lap down, but still capable of running with that lead draft when we come back for more of the excitement at Alabama International Motor Speedway. To action at Alabama International Motor Speedway. The field is back under green, and the race leader is Buddy Baker as they thunder into turn one and two. Let's set the situation on Bobby Allison, the lead car in that draft, as Baker tries to move up alongside. Allison is a full length of the racetrack down. In other words, he is in the lead lap, but only barely as they go three abreast down the chute, and Baker and Earnhardt continue to romp and stomp around this racetrack. Now they have put Bobby Allison one lap down with that move right there. Allison was the full length of the racetrack behind, but he was on the lead lap when the green flag came back out. Now he has gone a lap back down. The key there is a yellow flag condition. If a yellow flag comes back out again, Allison has got to be in front of Baker in order to stay on the same lap, and he's trying to get back there right now. For Bobby Allison right now, every lap is the white flag lap. In other words, every time around, it's the last lap of the race for Bobby Allison. He can afford to be passed because he cannot run up front with the top drivers right behind him, but he has to get back to the start-finish line every lap that he possibly can as the lead car. He's hoping and praying right now for a caution flag because if he leads the lead lap past the start-finish line, the caution flies, he goes to the tail of the field, and he's back among the race leaders. That race leader right now is Buddy Baker, who has led so much of this fray here today. Baker has just asserted himself from the beginning, and there's no surprise there. Here's Allison trying to take that lead back, and does. On the low side of the racetrack, can he hold it? Looks like he will. Allison's car has run so well down low in that low groove all day long, and now it is Allison back out front. But remember, he is not leading the race at this moment. The race leader is still Buddy Baker. Somebody that we've commented about several times today, but never yet commented about him in regards to being one of the leaders is Donnie Allison. And there he is. Donnie Allison is an orange and green car, seventh in line on your picture. There's the leader, Buddy Baker, going to the inside of Bobby Allison. Dale Earnhardt, second in the race, second in... And in car standings, as far as the number on the car, follow suit. He's in the second position in the race now. Bobby Allison trying to stick on the high side, and it's silver and black number 28. But remember Donnie Allison as we look at Ron Bouchard, car number 47, the Race Hill Farms entry, now out of the event. Donnie Allison is up among the leaders as a bright orange car. Look for him to try and assert himself toward the front. That has been a car, the Harry Hyde prepared machine, that many people viewed as a possible spoiler, a dark horse, if you will, in this race today. We started way back, but now the many caution flights, the six cautions that we've had today, have shuffled the deck and enabled Donnie Allison perhaps to pick up the slack that uh, is going to be left by Bobby if this race continues as it is right now. Remember now. Back in seventh spot, that is Bobby Allison in seventh position. Now running right behind him would be Waltrip and Rudd, the two similarly painted cars, one the Gatorade car, the other the Mountain Dew car. It is the Dew Crew machine of Waltrip now being shown third with Rudd back in the fourth spot. And Allison coming along in that uh, fifth Now is Richard Childress. Childress is also in the uh, no longer being shown in the lead lap. He is now two laps down. And Allison thunders back to the front. Your point again, well taken, Larry. I don't think we can emphasize it enough. Every lap is the last lap for Allison at this moment, and he is really working hard. You can see it visually. He has really picked up the pace. He's driving more aggressively than we've seen him run all day long. He's really working hard at it, Dave. He was content during much of the early running to sort of let the out let Buddy Baker lead it if he wanted to. Now Allison could not afford to do that. 
We have problems on the number 44 machine of Terry Labonte. The number 44 car is on pit road. The Corpus Christi, Texas driver of the Strattle Draft Buick. The hood is coming up. And what a big disappointment that is for the fifth place machine. Labonte, who has run so well here today, has been just outside the lead draft all during this competition, but in fact has set the pace for what has been the second draft in the field and that has been anywhere from a three to four car draft running for anywhere from sixth position back to the tail end of the top ten now Labonte's efforts have come to naught here as he's on pit road with the Huda. Baker and Allison boy what a great story what a couple of great champions they beat on each other down through the trioval Allison sporting back into the front and the pattern is certainly evolving here he is leading it at the flag and that is the key if something happens out there on the racetrack they do race back to the yellow flag if for example a crash were to occur right at this moment in the race those cars would continue at racing speed back around to the start finish line that's where they get the yellow and it is at that moment that allison must be in the lead if he's going to preserve his position within the lead lap and right now buddy baker has taken that spot back away from him baker is leading in the race allison is back unofficially now being shown in six Spot with Labonte going behind the wall. So Allison is on the lead lap in sixth position. Right now they're wheel to wheel down through the trioval. As we watch this tremendous shuffling going on up front, we're sorry to report for all of the fans in Franklin, Tennessee, particularly the young driver Mike Alexander, who qualified so well. There he is on your screen. The report from timing and scoring is that he has blown an engine, and this car is out of the event for today. He qualified so well, third fastest on the grid. Alexander was the fastest qualifier a week ago at five foot five, only 130 pounds. Certainly one of the stars of the future. That kid's going to make his mark on Grand National competition, believe me. To set a new track record at Martinsville just a week ago. Back up front now, Earnhardt has moved around Allison, but you see Allison just so aggressive as he continues his charge to stay with that lead pack and, in fact, to try to figure out a way. And really, a yellow flag is the only way at this moment, a that or a pit stop situation, that he can get back into his position in that pack. He is currently being shown as six. A good opportunity here to give a call to Tim Richmond, who was the rookie sensation of the Indianapolis 500 in an open wheel kind of competition a year ago. Richmond has moved into the top 10 with the retirement of Gary Labonte. So Tim Richmond, who is definitely one of the strongest rookies in this field, is now running in the top 10. Richmond came into today's race the second ranking rookie, second to Morgan Shepard, who surprised a lot of people as Allison goes back to the front of that lead draft again. Richmond was the second ranking rookie to Morgan Shepard coming into the race. Shepard has had a bad day involved in one of those early race crashes, so Richmond looks like he may be moving in on the rookie points leader, Morgan Shepard. Marvelous competition here at Alabama International Motor Speedway, and the race has had a very strange tempo. It just couldn't get going. They threw the green flag. We have 38 laps to go now, but when they threw that green flag, it only lasted for two before everybody has seen started spinning up in turn three. That the crash ultimately took out eight cars in the race, including some of the pre-race contenders, the likes of Benny Parsons and Richard Petty and Harry Gant, who all felt they had good opportunities to run strong here today. They were wiped out in an early crash. Just a few moments later, Neil Bonnet was kicked out of the draft and dropped off the pace. He had suffered a blown engine, and Bonnet, one of the Alabama gang contenders who was expected to run strong here, also retired. We had a total of six yellow flags so far, and four of those yellows came in the first 37 laps. Since then, it's been a good clean race. You know, we might make comment about Buddy Baker, Dale Earnhardt, and Daryl Walton battling with Bobby Allison. Now, they are also completely informed as to what the situation is by now. They have radio communications with their crew. The crew of each of those other three cars running up front has probably told their drivers, Buddy Baker, Dale Earnhardt, and Dale Walter, look, Allison is a lap down. Let, let, let us tell you what he's trying to do. He's trying to beat you to the start finish line every time around. So even though Bobby Allison is sweating it out more than the others and working hard, believe you me, Buddy Baker, Dale Earnhardt, and Daryl Waltrip, they're working hard too because they want to keep Bobby Allison a lap down. It's almost like three on one right now. 
Exactly right, because they would love to eliminate anybody they can from that lead draft. The ideal situation here would be for two of those cars to hook up and try to get away. Baker and Earnhardt have demonstrated the ability to do that on more than one occasion here today. They were the fastest in the draft in practice. Also, Earnhardt and Allison proved 205-mile-an-hour capability in the draft. But during the race itself, it's been Baker and Earnhardt who have been the most effective combination hooking up as a duo. They would like to do that. They'd like to get away and settle it between themselves. But believe me, Bobby Allison is having none of that, nor Darrell Waltrip or anybody else in that front pack. You know, we might talk a little bit about Bobby Allison, Hue Hueytown, Alabama. He is probably America's most active racing driver. Not only does he run a complete Grand National Circuit Series every year, but he travels across America visiting the grassroots racetracks from coast to coast. Week after week, he runs anywhere from two to four times a week. You run on a quarter-mile racetrack, a third-mile racetrack. He began his racing career about 20 years ago back in the Miami, Florida area. He is also one of the few drivers in Grand National Stock Car Racing who has experience in open-wheel, super-modified type race cars. Bobby Allison has ascended to the position of the third leading money winner of all time in Grand National Racing. He has won over $2.7 million in Grand National competition. Well, it was a year ago today that the two cars that are currently in positions one and two, the red number one of Buddy Baker and the blue and yellow number two of Dale Earnhardt and how appropriate that seems, finished one, two in this race. And Baker beat Earnhardt to the strike by three feet. Typical Talladega finish. We've seen it so many times here before, and it looks like we're going to have another one here today. This time there are four cars up there in the thick of it. Baker is your race leader, second in that draft. The second place car is Dale Earnhardt, the number two machine. The third place car is Darrell Walter. Fourth is Ricky Rudd. And in fifth spot, running almost a full lap behind, is Allison. Let me double check that. It is Donnie Allison who is running fifth. He is outside that lead draft. And then Bobby Allison, the leader in that draft, is sixth. I know that's perhaps a bit confusing as you can only watch the pack on your screen. But bear in mind that Bobby Allison is on the lap with the leaders. He is the full lap length of the racetrack behind them, however, at this moment, running on the racetrack in sixth position. And the key for him, we'll continue to emphasize, is that he must stay in front of Buddy Baker. Then, if a yellow flag comes out, he quickly circulates the racetrack. Oh, we've got a yellow. We've got the yellow right now. The word is that Darrell Waltrip has slowed dramatically, dropped out of that lead draft. Allison ahead of Baker, and there's the magic, Larry. He has done it. Bobby Allison has pulled the late race coup here, which will put him back among the leaders. And you know you can't see it on your screen, but if we could superimpose the face, I think you're going to see a smile that is as wide as this racetrack is long. Bobby Allison has got to be saying, boy, the good Lord is with me today. I worked really hard the last 15 laps, and it really paid off. Well, perhaps he's just looking at it from the standpoint that uh, he's just getting back his dues because <laughs> it was such bad it. luck that cost him the lap in the first place. I'll tell you one thing, Larry. That smile is mirrored in perhaps 50,000 faces around this racetrack. We've got another capacity crowd at Alabama International. And believe me, if there's anybody out there that they like, it's this guy right here. Bobby Allison, the leader of the Alabama gang from Deweytown, Alabama, has done just exactly what he had to do and demonstrated that he has the car to do it. He can run anywhere on the racetrack. He's got horsepower. He stayed in front of Baker. The yellow came out for Waltrip, and now Bobby Allison's going to be right back in the thick of it. This is a sport in this particular kind of automobile racing where the drivers, well, their legends are almost bigger than they are. And you're right. There's a tremendous amount of loyalty among the throng of fans that follows every one of these drivers. It's a real family affair coming to a Grand National race, and they're real serious about their support of their various drivers. As we go under yellow for debris on the backstretch, we are under yellow, and the situation is this. Buddy Baker is still your leader. The second-place car is Darrell Waltrip moving, or check that. The second-place car is Dale Earnhardt moving up to third is Ricky Rudd. Darrell Waltrip's situation in doubt as he had problems just as the yellow came out, and perhaps most significantly, Bobby Allison is right back among the leaders. We're setting up for a finish, and we'll be right back.
At Alabama International Motor Speedway, the Winston 500, we are prepared for a 30-lap dash to the checkered flag when we come back under green, and that field is preparing to do that right now as they move out of turn two and down the back chute at a leisurely 80 miles an hour. In just a moment, those speeds will escalate, approaching 200 miles an hour. The field has been replenished during this yellow for debris on the track, and they should be able to go the distance now at full speed. ESPN is your ticket to exciting top-ranked boxing every Thursday evening. Your Total Sports Network has joined forces with promoter Bob Arum, world light heavyweight champ Mike Robinson, just one of many titles who have already fought on ESPN. See the world's finest young fighter Thursday night when ESPN presents live top-ranked boxing. To give you an idea how fast the action is, remember the pole qualifying speed of Buddy Baker was 195-plus miles per hour. The last green flag lap before the caution flew was recorded at 196.6 miles per hour. So after 159 laps, or 422 miles, they are running faster than the fastest qualifier of the race. Well, I'll tell you what, the draft really has its effect, and that's another vivid example of it right there. We are coming down to a green flag with Buddy Baker in the lead. The four for that flicker of green that will put this field back to racing speed. Ricky Rudd is second. Bobby Allison rides to the third spot as they go thundering down into turn number one. We have had two developments while we were away. The wall trip problem was diagnosed as a clutch difficulty. That was right at the yellow flag. Allison going around Baker there to take the lead. Now remember, let's update you on three stories. Allison is back with the leaders. He has made up the virtually entire lap that he had lost. So it is now Buddy Baker moving around Bobby Allison and taking the lead. And Ricky Rudd is right there in the thick of it. Those three cars are all running together with 29 laps to go coming toward a finish. Waltrip, when that yellow flag came out, simultaneously went to the pit. It was unrelated. The yellow, oh, Baker almost bumped Allison as they came down into the tri-oval. Buddy looks over at Bobby and said, hey, we do this all the time, don't we? This is fun. These guys are something. The other dramatic development during that pit stop, a transmission problem for Dale Earnhardt, that has put him a lap down. As the yellow came out, Waltrip went into the pit with problem, and Earnhardt, as they came out, after his routine stop during the yellow, could not get the car back into gear. He had to come back into the pit. So Earnhardt, who has run so well throughout this race today, now with less than 30 laps to go, has been hit by mechanical problems. That's got to be a big disappointment for him. The sentimental favorite of that trio has got to be Ricky Rudd, the third place car among the leaders. Again, the two front cars are Buddy Baker in the red number one and the black and silver number of Bobby Allison running in third position in the race as we look at fourth, fifth, and sixth positions. There's Darrell Waltrip with car number 11 going by. He lost some time in the pits, but it looks like he has gathered up speed to make another run at the front three cars, and there are the front three cars. The third one in line, young Ricky Rudd, driving for one of the finest teams on the trail, but he has never won a Grand National stock car race, and a lot of people think he's due, and maybe today is just that day. Well, Darrell Waltrip now has his work cut out for him. And Waltrip. there goes Rudd, Dave. Beautiful move. Right underneath Buddy Baker, taking over second spot. Allison is the leader. Now Rudd showing in second spot with Baker falling back to third. There is Donnie Allison. Allison is your fifth place competitor, and as you can see, he has dropped down low on the track, and apparently the attrition that goes with 500-mile motor races is going to take the measure of this man today. We would anticipate that he will be coming to Pitt Road. A big disappointment for the Harry Hyde crew. Allison watching the leaders disappear as Donnie pulls on Pitt Road, and Bobby carries the colors for the Alabama game. Bobby takes the lead. He's got Rudd in second spot and Baker riding third. Waltrip, as we started to point out, is now a matter of just, oh, maybe six or eight car lengths behind that lead draft. If he can pull back up and get into that lead draft, he could be a factor of the team. There's Baker down to the inside, and now, Larry, they really start to feel each other out, don't they? Yeah, they do, and they should have a pretty good beat as to exactly where the best place on the racetrack is for their individual car. They just put a lap on Dale Earnhardt as Johnny Allison comes back out in that green and orange number 77 machine. This is the team that crashed at Daytona earlier this year. They were really hoping to do well at this massive 2.66 mile racetrack today to sort of make up for that. There 
now the three leaders again. Bobby Allison again has moved to the vanguard. Buddy Baker, who has won here more often than anybody else, seems to be in the best position right now. He's spent a lot of time watching Bobby Allison. He's not had to work quite as hard as Bobby in the past 15 laps. And Buddy seems to be able to, able to go around Bobby just about whenever he wants to. Ricky Rudd is showing some late race speed here. It makes you wonder, maybe this youngster has been saving something all day. That's nothing else. Win, lose, or draw. Ricky Rudd, the youngster, is certainly getting some valuable experience here with 164 of 188 laps in the book. Rudd is working with the leaders, and right there is Darrell Waltrip. Waltrip has roared up into contention, and I think that establishes him as a very strong contender because, remember, he had to break out of a pack and run by himself for five or six laps in the draft. That's a difficult thing to do. But Waltrip has managed to run down that lead draft. Earnhardt came with him, undoubtedly helped him in that task. Earnhardt goes several laps down running for points here. Baker goes to the lead, and look at Rudd. Waltrip rather come right with him. Waltrip is really flexing his muscles here. It is Baker, Allison, then Waltrip, now Rudd. And keep in mind that Dale Earnhardt, who has been a familiar face in that lead draft, is now a couple of laps down. Let's also not lose sight of the fact that this is a very prestigious race on the annual Grand National Trail. It is probably rivaled only by races that take place at the Daytona International Speedway. These guys all want to win this one very much. And you think back of some of the slam-bang, spectacular finishes that we have had at Daytona over the past few years, then modify that with the three-foot finish and difference between first and second of a year ago, here at Talladega, and boy, I'll tell you, the scene is set for an absolutely dramatic finish. Baker going to the inside. Walter had a notion on the outside, but decided if Buddy was going to go low, he better not try three abreast. And so, Baker goes inside Allison. Allison, door post to door post. Boy, what a battle. Walter hanging on to third. Ricky Rudd is tenaciously glued to his rear deck and enjoying the best seat in the house for some of the best racing on the tour. And Dale Earnhardt, even though he's several laps down, he'd like to be around at the finish of this thing. Allison back out front. We've got 167 laps in the book. They are working 168. We have 20 laps of this kind of action left. Four drivers are going to decide it among themselves. And when you try to pick a winner out of that pack, your challenge is a formidable one. The leader, Bobby Allison, currently on top of the Grand National standing. Buddy Baker, who has won at this racetrack more than any other driver. Darrell Waltrip with more victories this year than anybody else. And Ricky Rudd losing three or four car lengths there, but still very much a part of that lead draft, trying to upset them all and become the young driver who emerges at Talladega. In a situation like this, as we get very close to the end of the race, the term and the characteristic of aggression becomes a real factor. At this point, as you can see, these cars are reasonably closely matched in terms of performance. And you know, aggression is a strange word in an automobile racer's vocabulary. There's a very thin line between being over-aggressive and reckless and simply being an aggressive driver. But when it gets right down to it, anything is allowed when you're driving a race car short of colliding with another driver if you're going for victory. I think if you were going to uh, pick somebody out of that field who has experience in just that kind of finish, you'd have to give a nod to Darrell Waltrip. Darrell Waltrip is the guy who... He has uh, kind of skated along that fine line in the minds of some of these drivers, Larry. He has on occasion uh, uh, perhaps even gone a step across the line in the minds of some guys when they come down on that last lap. He's made the move that perhaps was just a bit beyond what would be accepted as the norm, but his attitude is, hey, the checkered flag is for the guy who wins it. I'm out there to try to do it. If anybody in this field got my nod for that last lap aggression, I think it would be Darrell Waltrip. Yeah, I buy that, and I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to kind of cop out a little bit. Rather than saying, I think so-and-so is going to win, I'm going to go with a little bit of sentimentality. See the young man making the move for the lead right now? That young guy is going to win a race, and he's going to win it sometime soon. I'm kind of hoping it's today. I'll tell you what, if it's today, the Ricky Rudd crew is going to the Chesapeake, Virginia folks, the Gatorade old team, are going to raise the roof on this speedway because that would be a big one to win. Where can you imagine, perhaps aside the Daytona, coming up with a victory that would be more spectacular for a first win than here at Talladega, Alabama, the world's fastest motor speedway. We have put the 170th lap in the book. 18 laps to go as this field thunders around. Keep in mind that the fifth car in that draft is Dale Earnhardt. He was in the lead draft all day long. Transmission problems of 10 laps to go have dropped 
him a full five laps down. There is one other car on the lead lap. That is Donnie Allison. He had to make an unscheduled pit stop just a few moments ago, as you saw. And that pit stop has knocked him out of an opportunity to be one of five cars going for the finish here. Instead, it will be a four-car battle. And that finish is going to be typical Talladega with four guys coming off turn four, thundering down to the stripe. And then it's just a matter of who's got the most hair right here through the trioval, which will be the jumping off point for that finish coming up now in just 19 laps. And it's a tricky part of the racetrack. We've mentioned that several times today, but I don't think we've developed it. You come rocketing off of those high banks, and it's like a manhole cover rolling down the street. Then the surface underneath you, underneath you flattens out, and it's like a frisbee. The car just sits right down on the ground, and it does all sorts of strange gyrations. It's not nearly as stable as it flattens out on the racetrack as it is on the 33-degree bank corner. Also a factor at this moment, and very much in the minds of these drivers, has to be that issue of mechanical reliability. Is the car strong? Is something going to go wrong in the late moments? These cars have all been beaten now for 171 laps, which translates to 454 miles of speed, of approaching 200 miles an hour. And oh, look at Baker. Baker's whirly a little bit as they come down through that tricky trioval area and head for turn one. And that could be a premonition, because if that car won't handle through there, he's not going to be able to make the move that he wants to on the last lap. And Allison took advantage of that to open up about oh, three, four, maybe five car lengths there for just a moment. They've got to be thinking about what might go wrong with the car. What's this with Allison? All the way down to the inside now, Larry. They're using every bit of racetrack. What a strange move. And you just wonder if that might have been a little bit of a psych job. Bobby Allison, almost like he was getting ready to retire from the race, but started right back up in front of the cars, barreling down right behind him, held him off, and he holds on to the lead for this lap. We have completed 172, working on 173 this time around. What that means is that we have 15 laps left. There really is a lot of time. It's like being in a pro football game when you get the two-minute signal. It doesn't sound like much time on the clock, but it is a long time in point of fact in regards to the length of the contest. 15 or 16 laps is a lot of time to talk strategy. And really, what's going on right now is these drivers know how many more laps they have to go, and they're all just setting up for the final lap. That's what it's come down to. 15 laps, about 12 or 13 minutes of the second to the last lap of the race, and then the last lap, about 45 to 48 seconds of foot to the floor, turn left, drive hard, and hope for the best. Kind of like standing up there on the high board, you know, the high diving board, waiting for that moment when you're going to jump off, because it's all got to happen on the last lap. Everything that goes before is just a preliminary. It's that last lap where you make the jump, commit yourself to the move, and go for it. We'll be back for that spectacular finish in just a moment. How close it is at Talladega. Five cars at approaching 200 miles an hour down the back chute, setting up for a finish in this, the 12th Winston 500. The two men on the point, Buddy Baker on the inside of the red number one, Bobby Allison on the outside, the silver and black number 28. They've both tasted victory here at Alabama International. In fact, Buddy Baker is trying to become the only man ever to win five times on this racetrack. He has already won four, and nobody else can make that claim. They have battled like this all day long, and now with 175 laps in the book, we are just 13 laps away from a finish, and look at them. They look like they're tied together, door points to door points. Well, we probably would be remiss as we look at the two leaders side by side, just inches apart. That's Buddy Baker on the inside and Bobby Allison on the outside. We would probably be remiss if we didn't remember some of the great previous winners of this race. Here comes young Ricky Rudd going down to the high side, almost, or the low side, almost down on the apron, and Rudd flexes his muscles. He moves into the lead. We are about to comment about some of the previous winners. Pete Hamilton, the winner of the first race in 1970. Donnie Allison, who's been a part of the story here today in 72. David Pearson won the first of three in a row in 1972. Buddy Baker, a three-time winner, 75, 76, and 80. Darrell Walter, who certainly has a chance today, was the 77 winner. Cal Yarbrough winning in 78, and Bobby Allison, the 1979 winner. I'll tell you what, that kid's strutting his stuff. Ricky Rudd has just romped and stomped around two of the all-time legends in stock car racing, Buddy Baker and Bobby Allison. And he has put his number 88 car, the Gatorade Oldsmobile, right out front. Now, Baker and Allison hook up, and here comes the draft right back on the inside. They're feeling each other out. They're showing off a little. 
little bit. They're seeing who's got the handle on what part of the racetrack. There is Ricky Rudd's crew, led by the crew chief, Bob Yates, Robert Yates. And boy, what a thrill it would be for them. After starting 10th today, if they could pull off the victory. 176 laps are in the book. They are preparing to complete lap 177. And there is not a sitting person in the house. A crowd approaching 100,000 all on their feet. And, well, I'll tell you what, it'd be hard to pick a favorite as far as the crowd is concerned here. Look at Allison and Tracy. Now, I'll tell you what, that is just marvelous driving after the kind of distance that they've had to go here. The concentration that it takes to run that close for that long is just remarkable. There's that Allison move again, down on the low side. He must feel as though he's got some advantage that car must feel real comfortable to him down there. You know, there are a lot of ways of having advantages in this race. Some of these guys have a, just a few more horsepower underneath the hood, and they have now found the places on the racetrack where they can get an advantage. A couple of these guys are at least tremendous athletes in the hand-eye coordination area, and that gives them their advantage. There's Bobby Allison going back to the inside of Buddy Baker, and very interestingly, Dave, they have opened up a little bit of distance between the two green cars. The inside car is Waltrip, the one on the outside was Ricky Rudd. There's about five or six car lengths now between first and second and third and fourth. Keep in mind that in theory, anyway, when you get out there and run side by side, it slows you down. Two cars side by side are not as effective in terms of drafting, and so perhaps as Waltrip and Rudd got this icing over third spot there, they let Allison and Baker hook up. You know what they'd like to do. They'd like to get the two of them away and settle it between them. A speculation, perhaps, on the Allison move that we're seeing down the back shoot as he continually runs way down on the inside of the back stretch. We'll remember that a year ago, when Buddy Baker beat Dale Earnhardt, the fifth man in this pack, five laps down, but still right on hand to watch the show, when Baker beat Earnhardt by three feet to the line, he made the pass going into turn three and then held him off down to the wire. So perhaps Allison is thinking that the back stretch is going to be the key, that that's where the move has to be made on the last lap, that in fact you can hold off a drafting driver who tries to swing shot around the outside here at Talladega, and in fact it is going into three and not coming out of four where the key will be. There is the Uno crew of number one Buddy Baker headed up by Haas Ellington, one of the legends in car and engine building. Boy, what a victory it would be here for him if he gets his fifth at this race track. Just another day at work. You can tell they're going at it like a businessman will be taking phone calls, checking out their records, checking out the charts, and uh, just doing their job. To reset the situation, if you just joined us, your timing was superb. We are now 180 laps into the 188 lap. Winston 500, the 12th running of this race at Alabama International Speedway. It has been a yellow flag Mars event was expected to perhaps be the fastest 500 miles in the history of auto racing. It is indeed going to be a rather slow race in terms of average speed because of the flurry of six yellow flags, four of them coming in the very early running of the race. But now it has stabilized. We're into the final lap with Bobby Allison, the leader, Buddy Baker in second spot. The third place car is Ricky Rudd. Fourth is Darrell Waltrip. The car that is fifth in the draft, Dale Earnhardt, number two in the ranks of Pontiac, is in fact five laps down and is not in the lead lap. And if indeed you did join us late, we also might remind you that some of the top contenders are not in the event. They were eliminated early on. Harry Gant, who has two second place finishes, as we look at Judy Allison, Bobby's wife, scoring for her husband, keeping track of what's going on to the racetrack. Benny Parsons also eliminated early by a crash. Richard Petty and Neil Bonnet, among the pre-race favorites who did not have an opportunity to participate in this rousing tussle for the final now seven laps of this year's version, the running of the Winston 500. Buddy Baker and Bobby Allison have been swapping the lead back and forth since we went back under three here with this lead four-car draft. Rudd held it once during the late laps of this race. Waltrip was impressive in catching up with this draft, but having caught them has not been able to go to the front. Whether or not he's waiting his opportunity or whether, in fact, he just doesn't have the steam, that's a matter of speculation that will be decided six laps from now. You know, another observation, and he'll probably make a liar out of me one lap after I mention this, but I've been watching Dale Earth that Earnhardt is really playing the gentleman's role in what's going on right now. He has been with the lead draft. There is Elliot Forbes Robinson, the sporty car type, who's been out there running among them all day long. He's moved up to the top 15 for the last half of the race and looks like his day is over. We're commenting that Earnhardt has been with the lead draft and I know he has the ability to 
to dice and do passing. But I have the feeling he knows he has no opportunity to win this race. He wants to stay with the lead draft to perhaps pick up a couple of other positions back in the pack. But he has not jeopardized any of our four leaders by running up alongside him. The signal has just been given. Harold Kinder has flashed to the field. Five laps to go. 183 laps are in the book. These Grand National Superstars of Winston Cup Racing have hurtled and thundered around this racetrack. They've spun, they've tagged the wall, they've blown engines. They've done everything imaginable out here today. And it has sorted itself down to this. With less than five laps to go, Buddy Baker goes to the inside of Bobby Allison, and they shuffle that lead. Can you imagine the number of lead changes that this race record will record? There must have been a dozen of them in the last five laps. Baker and Allison running in the third spot is Walter. Fourth is Rudd, and those four are going to decide it in less than five. Literally, you know who's going to win this race is the team that has the best set of mathematicians on it. And I say that very literally, not figuratively. Every one of those first four cars has shown us that that team has the ability to go to the front. The question is, when do you make your move to move to third, to move to second, to eventually move to the lead? It doesn't look like anybody is going to be able to hook up as a one-car or two-car draft and break away. The team that can figure out through conjecture when is the best time to make that move, they're the ones that are going to win this. And you know what? I'll speculate. I think the magnificence, perhaps, of auto racing is that for all the effort and all the teamwork and all the coordination that goes into building these automobiles now, as the leaders work their way through lap traffic, in the final analysis, it comes down to the man who holds the wheel and pushes down the pedal. It's just been a superb race, and now it's going to be up to one of these four drivers to demonstrate that remarkable surge on the last lap that will pull out the victory. And I'll tell you what, the way they're running, we could see them come down there for a breath. It could be the greatest finish in Talladega history, and it is now less than three laps away. Well, I'll tell you, I, I almost feel like just sitting back and watching these guys because words cannot describe what's going on right now. Four superstars in their chosen profession, they are putting on a tremendous job. There's just no way of describing the fantastic effort that each of these four guys has made, each in his own right. At least two of these drivers has had trouble this day. They've had some problems with the race cars. Buddy Baker had some mechanical problems with the race car. Bobby Allison, they had to do some repair on the sheet metal. Ricky Rudd, the young driver who has never, never won a super speedway race, race and Darrell Walter also delayed in one of his late pit stops. They have all overcome adversity today. We have recorded 186 laps, six laps. They are on the second turn. Now the back stretch with one and one half laps to go. 197 and a half miles an hour on the last lap. They are running a full two miles an hour faster than they qualified out here. As Buddy Baker takes Walter into the number two spot, the move, Waltrip went with him, Allison puts the foot down up on the top side and holds off Waltrip, that's another key move, here is a charge on the inside from Ricky Rudd, they are coming to the white flag, indicating one lap to go, down into the dry oval, this is going to be the battleground, just one lap from now, the white flag is out, the final lap of the Winston 500 is underway, Baker and Allison open it up, fire about two, Did everything imaginable to try to get around him. Ricky Rudd, 
I think, was content to sit back and, and watch it all happen. There was no place for him to go. There's uh, Bobby's dad, the man with the cooler. You can see him there in the red cap and the gray shirt sitting, uh, holding the cooler there beside the pit wall. That's Bobby's dad. And boy, how proud he must be of his young son who has won the Winston 500. I'll bet the crew feels retribution for Daytona. It's got to be a nice way to make up for what happened at Daytona. A spectacular finish. Buddy Baker got to be pleased. I mean, his record at Alabama International Speedway continues to be superb. A wreck marred race. The Allison crew thrilled, excited. Seven caution flags in this race here today, but that's all forgotten now as Bobby Allison salutes his legions of Alabama fans rolling down Fifth Road and into some of the most hallowed real estate in all of racing, Victory Lane, here at Alabama International Speedway. He'll stop to pick up the members of his crew and take them for a most enjoyable Sunday ride here. Waddell Wilson, whom Allison calls the finest engine builder and crew chief in the business, certainly built a good 500-mile rocket ship for this race here today. Now they're all saddled up on the fenders and on the doors of that number 28 machine as they head for victory lane. We know they showed up at Daytona with the Pontiac, and they've made the switch to the Buick race car for this super speedway race. And they, they got to feel like they made the right decision. They felt that the change of rules really prohibited the Pontiac car from running up front. And today, with the switch to the Buick, as so many of the top teams have done, the Buick just seems to be the right combination of aerodynamics and horsepower right now to run up front. And today, a Buick race car carried Bobby Allison to his second Winston 500 race in three years. Well, for Bobby Allison, his second victory in this race, won it in 79, came back to win it again in 1981, and if there was ever a race that he can chalk up on the wall as one that he earned, it was this one here today. He defeated Buddy Baker by a car length as they came to the stripe, Baker finishing in second spot. Baker had Darrell Waltrip's front fender right alongside his doorpost as Waltrip came home third, and Ricky Rudd did a spectacular job in finishing fourth. The last car on the lead lap was Donnie Allison. What a great day for the Alabama game. We'll be back in just a moment. A tremendous celebration underway in Victory Lane. There with the winner is our Ned Jarrett. Well, congratulations, Bobby, on the super win. And I'm really tickled. The car runs so strong all day. You know, I could just go right back by those guys. But it kept lining up and... Getting in line and getting back by me, so uh, we uh, we just had to sit there and depend on this old Waddell Wilson engine to pull us on through. Have you ever won a 500-mile race and had so many problems? No, and uh, you know we talked earlier that uh, so far we had never made up a lap, but we made up a lap today. We had a lot of problems, and uh, the guys just kept on working and kept on working. All I had to do was sit in there so that we had somebody to wave when the race was over. Bobby, the loft bumper from the rear didn't seem to affect you that much. Well, the car got a little bit looser, but, uh, you know, I couldn't uh, really tell anything bad. The guys looked at the tire wear for us, and uh, I was real pleased that uh, they come back and said the tire wear was good. And, uh, you know, everything just super. I'm just tickled. And, of course, this uh, locked up the first leg of the point standing for you, put you in good shape towards your first national championship. Well, that's the best way to do it that I know how. It certainly is. Judy, his wife, I know you're real proud here, too. I sure am. Very exciting. You had to be on pins and needles many I times sure today. <laughs> well, she's relaxed. Well, I guess you might say relaxed right now. Of course, there's a lot of celebration here in Victor Lane at a popular victory here in Alabama for one of its home state heroes. Bobby Allison, leader of the Alabama gang, proud victor here in Alabama in the Winston 500. We'll be back with some final thoughts in just a moment. happy Bobby Allison crew on the five racers Buick prepare to head for victory lane and we get another look at that our final look at this Winston 500 well Bobby Allison won forty one thousand seven hundred dollars here today in a race that saw 44 lead changes among 10 drivers it was that kind of competition we had seven caution flags for a total of 44 laps that played very heavily in the final outcome of this race the time on the event was just a few ticks of the watch over three hours but the big story was all at the finish line where four men came down to the finish allison winning it over buddy baker with daryl waltrip third 
and Ricky Rudd right there in fourth spot. A lap down was Donnie Allison in fifth. But those first four cars less than a half second apart, Larry Newber, that's a typical Talladega finish. It was very typical, and we set this up as possibly the fastest 500-mile race in history. It wasn't that, but had to certainly be among the most exciting. No doubt about it, another Winston 500 goes into the book. For Ned Jarrett and Larry Newber, I'm Dave Despain. Thank you for being with us. The Winston 500 has been brought to you by Dotson, who suggests that when you're looking for a new car or truck that delivers economy, value, and quality, have a Dotson. Here include Richard.